and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily for a Wednesday afternoon. Another off day in the series, and I think probably good for the teams and certainly for the fans as the Winnipeg Jets are on the ice pretty much as we go live here at 1 o'clock Central on YouTube before tomorrow's Game 5 facing elimination down 3-1 to one in their first-round series against the Vegas Golden Knights. We'll be paying close attention to reports from Las Vegas on the Winnipeg Jets skate as to Nikolai Ehlers, Mark Scheifele's status. Should have some updates very quickly. And in the second hour of the program, after finishing up with the skate and talking to the coaches and players, Murata Tesh of The Athletic will join us from Sin City. Uh, we'll also get the latest on the Vegas Golden Knights with uh, our old pal Gary Lawless. We'll also talk a little Manitoba Moose. Is the Moose ready for the postseason beginning their series against the Milwaukee Admirals Friday at Canada Life Centre? And the Moose Rookie of the Year, Manitoba native Dean Stewart, is going to jump on the program as well. So lots to get to. Busy night in the National Hockey League last night in the Stanley Cup playoffs. We'll hit that. The Ice know who they are playing in the third round beginning on Friday as well. We'll get to that and uh, much more on today's episode of WST. Just before we bring in Michael Remus, a big thanks to the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Cool Bet Canada, Princess Auto, Canadian Club, Manitoba Battery, Aquatech, Modern Man Barbershops, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, F Apparel, Wallace and Wallace, Vita Health Fresh Market, Consolidated Supply, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, Breezy Bend, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, Little Brown Jug, and we will get to a why not question of the day for our friends over at Not Auto Corp at Waverly and McGilvery. Uh, let's get Remo in here. Remo, for the first time in this series, a little bit of an um, extra day to breathe, if you will, for fans, uh, and a slow night tonight in the National Hockey League, but lots to get to from last night. But, of course, uh, as we get into this program, keeping a keen eye on on what is coming out of Vegas with this skate this afternoon. And uh, from the sounds of it, no Mark Shifley on the ice. As uh, I just see a tweet from Ken, uh, that Cole Perfetti's out in the non-contact jersey, but no Mark Shifley right now. And I can't say that's surprising, considering what happened in Game 4. Yeah, I know they said he was uh, hopeful. That's what Bonus said yesterday, going with the day-to-day. -day. But, you know, I think his day-to-day... It's been kind of debunked considering Ehlers has been day-to-day -day the entire the entire series. So take what, you know, interpret it whatever way you want. Um, you know, he got, it was a really hard collision. I mean, that was like a stunt man going into the boards. I mean, how hard he went. I mean, it was pretty loud. He left, didn't come back. So I don't know what could have changed uh, that, you know, why he would be able to play tomorrow. So I'm not too optimistic just based on the collision base that he didn't play. And now he's not on the ice. So we'll wait and see what Rick Bonus says. Um, John Liu actually posted a picture of Morgan Barron. He's got rid of the cage. You can't chirp him for having a bird cage anymore. I don't know if that's just for practice, but he's wearing a visor. Just eight days. Has it been eight days? It feels like it was yesterday. He got 75 plus <laughs> stitches around his eye. And um, they got three goalies out there. John Liu says Holm, Salmonen, Hellebuck, no David Riddich, uh, lower body injury. And Jamie Thomas saying, no Shifley, as we said, Stanland or Dubois. And we know Stanland, he's been day-to-day, -day, played a lot. Uh, last game after Shafley got hurt, I'm 
seems like he's going to be okay. And Dubois, I feel like he's been kind of on maintenance like the whole the whole season has. So, um, and Ehlers is on the ice. I don't know if we if we did say Ehlers. So maybe yeah, well, that's I mean, let's not bury the lead. Ehlers is out there, and he's skating with Nemetsnikov and Niederreiter on the second line. But yeah, um, three centers aren't there. <laughs> Uh, Stenny out. You just mentioned he's been sort of day to day. Mark Shifley not there. Um, again, I have very, very low hopes that Mark Shifley is going to be able to play. Um, and even if he was in the game, I mean, how much he'd be able to bring to the Jets' um, attack? Uh, very much up in the air after what happened in that last game. Uh, but no Dubois as well. And. I would imagine this has been a really physical series. Uh, I'm not sure how much you're getting out of a practice at this point. Certainly if you've been playing 20 plus minutes a night like Dubois has. Um, so the way things look right now, and there's a lot of placeholders, um, it's Connor with Gustafson and Wheeler. This is all from Ken Weeb. Ehlers with Nemetsnikov and Wheeler. Uh, Barron with Lowry and Appleton. And then uh, Axel and Saku Mental line in the, uh, uh, I guess the fourth line, but it's a two man fourth line. They didn't put Cole Perfetti in there. He's sort of with Capo Pianco uh, in a defense pairing, I guess, maybe just doing a bit of a pl uh, place holding. But Dylan Pionk, Schmidt DeMello, Stanley, and Samberg. As the uh, as the defense pairings that we expect to see, and then yes, as you mentioned, three goaltenders: Connor Hellebuck, but also Arvid Holm and Oskari Salmon, and from the Manitoba Moose, who were both brought on the trip, and no David Riddick, big save Dave injured, and that's part of the reason why the uh, extra goalies from the Manitoba Moose, two of them, not just the normal one at the playoffs, are both with the club. Um, but I will say this, and I guess we'll talk more to Murad about this a little later on, Reem, but interesting to note that it is Blake Wheeler that is with Kyle Connor. And if you assume that, you know, Gus is just simply a placeholder for Pierre-Luc Dubois, might we see, and again, fingers crossed that Ehlers can go, um, Ehlers back with Nemetsnikov and Nito Niederreiter and Blake Wheeler after being one of the best Jets on the ice in Game 4, potentially getting an opportunity to play top line minutes with Connor and PLD. Yeah. I'm assuming Gustafson is a placeholder there. As first, my first thought was, is he a placeholder for Mark Shifley? Cause we've seen Connor Shafley Wheeler, but sorry, PLD actually makes, makes more sense. And you know, Ehlers and Nemestikov have played well. I do like that line. So you know, maybe this is the return of Ehlers. So we'll wait to hear what Rick bonus has to say. Uh, and then we'll talk about it with Murat after. Um, the Jets haven't scheduled a live stream or anything, so we'll have to stay tuned to Twitter updates and we'll hear from Marat. So maybe that's a positive sign. And, um, you know, the third line, Baron Lowry Appleton looks good. So, uh, we'll have to see, see what, I don't I mean, it's hard to know what's going to happen, but I think that that is a positive sign about Ehlers sounds like. Well, I, listen, just the fact that he's out there, the fact that he's skating, that he's taking that spot on that line and. I mean, I, I really think that if there was a, uh, and again, this is so hard to speculate because as we've talked about this, this has been one of the weirdest injury sagas I can remember in a long time. I mean, it's not often that injured players speak to the media. So when Nikolai Ehlers spoke to the media going into the series and said, I'm ready, I'm good to go, I'll be in game number one, I think everybody took that at face value. And all of the jockeying that we often get from head coaches about whether a guy is in, I mean, my, I was certainly guilty of it, sort of brushing off Rick Bonus, saying that he was day-to-day. -day. Um, if a guy says he's playing, he's playing, it's the playoffs, of course that'll happen. And now as we know that he has not been cleared by the medical team for the last four games to get into the lineup. Um, the Jets need... All hands on deck. Everyone that's available, um, they need their best from coming up in game number five if they're going to get this thing back to Winnipeg for game number six on Saturday. And um, Ehlers is such a big, big hole in the lineup when he's not there. Um, you just can only hope that this goes well today, that the docs say you are good to go. And if that does happen, Reem, I can tell you one thing. Nikolai Ehlers is going to be, uh, he'll probably look like he shot out of a rocket when this game go goes. I can't imagine how hard it's been to sit in the press box and watch these games after um, the season that he's had with injuries earlier on and um, and knowing what he's able to do when he's out there uh, along with his teammates. So 
Um, you know, he was the driver of that number two line after, you know, they moved Mark Shifley to the wing along with Dubois and Connor. Um, and his absence has been a big, big hole in the lineup. So, uh, listen, they're very likely going to be without Mark Shifley. You know they're going to be without Josh Morrissey. Um, certainly would be nice to see 27 get back in there and see if he can maybe be a bit of a difference maker and get this series back to the peg. Yeah, it's been strange with the Eelers. You know, you go from not practicing and then you start practicing and you're practicing on the first power play unit and then you're back to not practicing at all. And now he's on the ice and Ken's tweeting out uh, he's wearing a regular jersey. They're just waiting to see which power play unit, which could be a tell. And um, Ken also updates Carson Kuhlman is the fourth line right winger, at least for the time being. I'm assuming, you know, Brass Balls Blake is in chat saying, well, what if Ehlers is a placeholder? And I guess it would be for, for Stenland or something because he played a lot of second line when, when Trafley was out. But we'll... we'll you know, we can speculate now, and it's, it's pretty fun. But we'll have they a, need Stenny to play center. Yeah. Well, they need I, Stenland's I not agree. moving up to be on the wing if Shifley's not in. Well, I mean, they basically ran three centers. It was Dubois, Lowry, and Stenland last. And you know, you would think that Gus would come in and be presumably a fourth line center if Stenny's going to be moved up into that spot that was held by Mark Shifley. Uh, but right now, there, I mean, there hasn't been an additional call up. And when you're looking at the center depth right now. That's basically it, as uh, as the Winnipeg Jets have right now. One guy that I know we've talked about off air and has been mentioned in the chat and some other conversations is Jansen Harkins. Um, he's not with the club right now. He's getting ready to play uh, with the Manitoba Moose on Friday uh, in the playoffs. And we will talk Moose with Dean Stewart coming up a little later on. I will say this. I'm a little surprised that Hark wasn't maybe with the club, at least for the last week. Um you know, since he was returned to the Manitoba Moose, all the guy's done is score at a rate we haven't seen in a long time. Two 50-point players on the Moose this year, but one of them, Jansen Harkins, who did it in 44 games. So um, we've seen Harkins be able to play at the NHL level before, sort of, I think, found himself as somewhat of an odd man out or out of favor. But a player like that, if you if if given the opportunity to come in and play, um, I think brings a little bit of a different dimension and also a guy that, you know, realizes that this could be his last and only chance maybe to get a little bit of a taste. Now, I guess maybe we won't waste too much time talking about it because it doesn't seem like it is happening. But I will say this, dude, um, <laughs> you know, if they're talking about adding in a player like Carson Kuhlman, who no disrespect, I mean, I think does a lot of the things that the coaching staff likes in depth players. Um, Winnipeg Jets need to generate more. They need to go to the net more. They need to get those dirty and greasy goals. And Jansen Harkins has been a guy that can do that. He does have that club in his bag. Uh, that being said, we'll see him do that for the Moose on Friday night as opposed to tomorrow night in Las Vegas. Yeah, and Ken uh, ap- adding updates just two minutes ago. Uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois standing on the bench for part of practice. So I would imagine he's good to go. I think we kind of figured he was just maintenance. Appleton started the skate, went down the tunnel. We'll see what Bonus has to say about the guys not on the ice. So, Ken, minute by minute updates here on a Winnipeg Sports Talk, and we'll <laughs> we'll get it at by by the end of the show. Yeah. So, uh, again, don't read too much into uh, Dubois' absence. Um, I think we can read a little bit into Mark Shifley's absence in that you know if he was going to give it a go today to see how he felt, maybe ahead of tomorrow night's game. Um, you know, you might have seen that as a positive. That isn't the case. Certainly, that doesn't rule him out. Um, but I think the smart money is on Mark Shifley probably not being in the lineup. Certainly, we know Josh Morrissey's not going to be in. But if you're looking for a little bit of a silver lining, the fact that Nikolai Ehlers is out there right now, um, certainly positive. I mean, he's not playing if he can't get out there and skate with his uh, teammates in an optional or a practice uh, but we'll wait for more clarity a little later on when the coach speaks. And uh, Murata Tesh will join us from Las Vegas a little bit later on. Um, listen, I want to get to the Stanley Cup playoffs, Reem. And I mentioned that we are going to be talking Calder Cup playoffs with Dean Stewart coming up a little later on in the program. But we know now who the Winnipeg Ice are going to be playing in their third round playoff series. And that is the Saskatoon Blades, who... Uh, Pulled the reverse sweep last night. They dropped the first three games of their series 
to the Red Beer, uh, the Red Deer Rebels, and last night completed the comeback, becoming only the third club in WHL history to win a best of seven series after losing the first three games. Good on the ice for getting taking care of the uh, Moose Jaw Warriors in six games. That extra couple days, once you get to this point in the playoffs, can certainly be helpful. And uh, they get right at it Friday and Saturday here at the Ice Cave as, um, you know, they're now down to the Final Four. And, of course, Brad Lambert and the Seattle Thunderbirds, the top two teams, and uh, playing in a matchup over on the west side of the uh, of the, of the um, tournament bracket. Um, two great series, top two seeds on both sides. Um, you know, while we obsess about the Winnipeg Jets, knowing that their backs against their against the wall, this is going to be a fun weekend. Um, regardless of what happens in Vegas tomorrow night, because both the Calder Cup playoffs and the WHL playoffs continue with the Moose and the Winnipeg Ice. Now knowing that they're taking on the Blades, yeah, we're all counting down to this uh, potential Ice Thunderbirds what the uh, final here. So uh, we're one series away. And, you know, congratulations to the ice on getting as far as they have. You know, I know they were disappointed about last year. They've had such a great season. And hopefully it continues here in this upcoming series. Yeah, it's some big, big crowds in Saskatoon through the playoffs. Of course, they had that Regina series where they were filling the barn with everyone wanted to get a glimpse of, a glimpse of Connor Bedard. Uh, but, man, another 9,000 fans last night at Saskel, uh, Sastel Center. And a uh, 5-2 win for Saskatoon. So it's Winnipeg and Saskatoon in that series. And it begins on Friday at the Ice Cave. Tickets on sale right now. Get on over to the Winnipeg Ice website if you want to count yourself in for that game on Friday. Of course, Moose playing Friday as well at Canada Life Centre. And we'll uh, touch on that coming up a little bit with uh, with Dean Stewart. Um, let's get to last night's action in the National Hockey League. And again, we'll stay on top of everything coming out of Vegas and have a report live from Vegas with uh, Murata Tesh a little bit later on. Um, but another fun night of playoff hockey. And, you know, let's start off with the early game, Remo. I mean, uh, I'm here to move on from the disappointment of yesterday coming out of game four, realizing what the situation is. The Winnipeg Jets need to find a way to win a game and get it back to home ice. And, uh, a little bit of an inspiring performance from a team in a similar situation. The New York Islanders last night going down to Carolina and finding a way to get that win. The Islanders are not dead yet. They survived 3-2 and will be hosting the Canes in game six at home, trying to make it a best of, a, a seventh and deciding game back down in Carolina. Well, yeah, this was the series that everyone thought um, you know, had upset potential. The Carolina Hurricanes, they've had problems scoring goals since Fetchnikov got hurt. Tuvo Teravainen gets injured, but they've chugged along. And uh, shout out to what, Brock Nelson scoring the second goal of the game. Hit Sebastian Ajo, the Hurricane Sebastian Ajo, in the face, and then he batted it. Uh, out of the air, into the back of the net, off the face. That's one of the crazier goals that, that you'll see. And Ajo did uh, end up scoring, so he came back. We've had a lot of Ajo and Ajo uh, crime in this one. I know the announced team has enjoyed whenever uh, they're going up against each other, and they even uh, were in the penalty box in the same time in, in the third period. The defenseman Ajo on the Islanders and the Hurricanes, Sebastian Ajo. Uh, not confusing at all. Hustler, not not. Confusing. Hey, you know what? I, just not to not to go too far back, but in my minor hockey days, I was number eighteen for River Heights, playing against number eighteen for Riverview, both named Andrew Patterson, <laughs> with one T. Oh, it was one of those, and it was one of those, uh, one of those um, tournaments where you know uh, when you're a kid but you know they'll announce the goals and stuff oh and yeah, yeah i don't know i had scored and then two seconds later he scored and it basically sounded like the same thing and then i frankly i've been getting mistaken for the other andrew patterson my entire life because he was in fact my brother's defense partner on the winnipeg south blues for a number of years and everyone just assumed it was me you know he was the far better hockey playing andrew patterson so uh Shout out to my pal, Junior. We actually lived together for a while in university, too, and you can imagine how confusing that was with two guys with the same damn name. Part of the reason why so many people know me as Hustler, it was almost a necessity when you uh, have two guys living in the same place before everybody has cell phones. Anyways, I digress. Uh, Aho versus Aho will continue. Game six, 
back on Long Island. Islanders not dead yet. That's what the Winnipeg Jets need to do tomorrow night. Find a way to win and get this series back to the peg for a game six. I will say this, Reem. Uh, as, uh, you know, as down as I think a lot of people were, myself included, last night because of what had happened on home ice for the Winnipeg Jets, I did take an element of solace and enjoyment seeing the Minnesota Wild lose last night to the Dallas Stars. Um, that being said, I was somewhat triggered again where it didn't even take two minutes into last night's game in Dallas for Marcus Foligno to lay out Radic Faxa with a brutal knee that cost him five game or five minutes and a game misconduct. Dallas scored eight seconds into the power play and never looked back. Um, Minnesota continues to be, I'm sure for Jet fans' perspectives, the most reviled team on the docket, already looking forward to getting that team to Canada Life Center next year. Um, but if you're still angry, like many are, about Ryan Hartman on Nikolai Ehlers and the fact that he hasn't been able to play, maybe you cracked a little bit of a smile seeing the Wild get taken to the woodshed last night by the Dallas Stars. Yeah, 4 nothing. Um, Minnesota scoring zero goals. They're now down 3-2 to Dallas on the verge of elimination. And I know a lot of Jets fans um, that we've heard from not happy with Minnesota. It was not cool of Ryan Hartman to hit an unsuspecting Nikolai Ehlers. Just a, a dirty play. Only got suspended one game, and Ehlers hasn't played since. And they were at it again. What did we say? A couple minutes into the game, Marcus Foligno, um, who has a history, knees Radic Fax, Radic Faxa, and he gets a five-minute major. They did review it. He, he did get a, it was They stayed with the major. We haven't had anything about a hearing. It seems like they're just going to go with the one. But you know, Marcus Foligno, I just remember him punching Pierre-Luc Dubois in the back of the head in the middle of a scrum. Um, and then people were tweeting at you and I the time that he was suspended two games for getting in a fight with Adam Lowry and kneeing him in the head. Uh, while he was down. Again, two of those moves, punching a guy in the back of the head and kneeing a down opponent you cannot do in the UFC. And Marcus Foligno taking that to the NHL. And there he was yesterday trying I to take... I, I love when you drop the that's that, not even allowed in the UFC line. That's my favorite um, line. That's, when, when a, that's a common one. Well, and you know what? This is funny. I'm sort of surprised. Like, MC Stormy is in uh, is in chat. And I'm assuming you're talking about this Foligno incident from last night, saying that hit wasn't dirty. And then Tico and Apolli says, in fairness, Felino didn't knee him. I mean, here's why not question of the day for not Autocorp today. I mean, um, did you not think that that was a five-minute major? I mean, took a run at the guy. The only contact he made was with his knee on the inside of Fax's knee. And he was taken off and removed from the game. I mean, I, put it this way. I didn't think there was any chance that that was not going to be five minutes in a game. I thought they got got the call right, and I didn't see a lot of that out there, but um, if there are, I, I would be interested to hear if there are many other opinions as to how that was not a five-minute major and not a very dirty play, because to me, that was right out of the Minnesota Wild rule book, and a guy in Marcus Foligno that, as you just laid out, Remo, has plenty of of examples of doing exactly that and uh, a pretty extensive rap sheet from the National Hockey League. Yeah, I don't think he's earned the benefit of the doubt at all. We know how this team plays. You know how he plays. I remember he pulled that dumb Superman punch in a fight with Brandon Dillon, which was the, the dumbest. <laughs> Superman so. punch. Um, Guy watches too much WWE. <laughs> he's Roman Reigns. The tribal so, chief, Marcus really, Foligno. Well, clearly, I mean, he's trying it like – drop knees on guys and like attack them when they're not expecting it. So um, we're all happy to see Minnesota out and they've had so much playoff uh, futility and hopefully it continues for them. Cause uh, I know a lot of Jets fans unhappy with Minnesota and hope, hope that they lose in the first round. Swerve 95 says you were dropped on your head as a kid, Andrew swerve. I know that you have had a wild logo as your chat icon, and it's now conveniently changed to the twins. So um, I'm I'm going to take that for what it's worth, considering that I'm pretty sure you've got some major skin in the game when it comes to the wild. And I get it. I mean, wild fans didn't like it. A lot of wild fans 
did correctly say, though, that was Bush League and stupid, and it put them in a really bad situation. It was a terrible way to start the game, and in a lot of ways, they never recovered from it last night. So, listen, the Wild do this all the time, um, and you know what? If you can't kill your penalties and you're taking quality players, I mean, as much as you know, we don't like Foligno or whatever, I mean, the guy can be a difference maker, taking himself out of the game, um, you know, you're going to pay the price against a good team like Dallas. Tyler Sagan got that goal right off the bat, and um, as I said, they never looked back, and don't look for a lot of sympathy for the Winnipeg, uh, for the Man- Minnesota Wild around Winnipeg these days, considering the Hartman cheap shot that has cost Nikolai Ehlers the opportunity to play in the first four games of this Stanley Cup playoff series. Um, and then we had Edmonton and L.A., and uh, Remo, I gotta say, it really does feel like the Edmonton Oilers Um, they dodged their bullet in game number four, down 2-1 and down 3-0, and uh, they are rolling right now, feeling it. Zach Hyman's now getting into it. Evander Kane's getting into it. Leon Dreisaitl scores every game. Connor McDavid's the best player in the world, and even if their goaltending has been somewhat iffy at times, uh, it doesn't matter because they're going to outscore you, and that's exactly what they're doing to a very good L.A. Kings team that normally does not give up half a dozen goals. Yeah, good for Edmonton. You know, they went back with Stuart Skinner yesterday after he was pulled in game four. And, you know, he's a rookie, so there's been a lot of questions about him over the, you know, they signed Jack Hamill to this huge offseason contract, and he's not the guy for them. It's been Stuart Skinner for the second half of the year, and he did get pulled. Campbell was good in relief, but not enough uh, to be started. And I talked about Aho getting a puck off the face and Brock Nelson, you know, scoring off the rebound from that, it was Zach Hyman. Uh, again, that's a cool th- cool new thing, scoring off your face. So, uh, you know, what a signing that has been. I remember when he signed, you know, a lot of people thought, uh, maybe myself, that was a bit of an overpay, but he's been awesome for them. So, you know, credit to the Oilers. And a lot of talk now, Leon Dreisaitl, playoff Leon, uh, the increase of points, that he, points per game that he has in the playoffs over regular season. If you thought that was even possible, um, it's been huge for them, so... Uh, credit to the Oilers, you know, that maybe took them a couple games to find it, you know, losing there in the overtime. But, uh, hey, they're on their way to the next round, and so is Toronto. So I think we'll have at least one Canadian team uh, in the next round. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you just put the Leafs in the second round? Well, I said two because teams. Because they're I not said done yet. Ca- that's not what I said. They're I not said done two, yet. I said two Canadian teams are up 3-1. So the odds are one of them will advance. I think there's a pretty good chance that the Edmonton Oilers are going to be there. Um, weird thing about this Oilers series is they don't play again until Saturday. I guess the Clippers and the Lakers are taking over Crypto.com Arena for the next little while. So um, we're going to need to wait until Saturday for that game. Um, a little bit of a lighter week. And again, only two games in the National Hockey League tonight. You've got Florida, Boston. And the Seattle Kraken and the Colorado Avalanche playing their fifth game. Florida on the road facing elimination. Similar situation to what the Jets will be facing tomorrow night. And the Kraken, upstart Kraken in Colorado, tied 2-2. And, of course, Kale McCarr suspended for game five for um, his cheap shot on, uh, on, on Jared McCann. We didn't talk a lot about that play yesterday, just being all wrapped up in what happened with the Winnipeg Jets, but that was a really weird one. I mean, when you look at it on its own, I mean, it looks very similar to the uh, Pierre Turgeon, um, one that, you know, of course, who was that that, 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 that ran him um, way back uh, with the Washington Capitals? It escapes me right now, but a 20-game suspension. Yeah, Dale Hunter. Yeah, that's right. Um you know, McCann, the play, the puck was out of play, wasn't expecting anything. And McCarr, basically, his excuse was that he thought that, you know, the puck was there and it was still going on. Um, put it this way, I think he's quite fortunate that he only got one game. Because, um, man, I mean, you knock a guy out, you know, their, their 140 goal scorer. Um, as I said, maybe if he uh, had a, he had a much cleaner record than some of the other offenders, like a Dale Hunter. <laughs> Um, but man, that's a big loss for uh, for Seattle, and uh, we'll see what happens tonight. That's the late game after Florida plays the Boston Bruins. Um, all right, we are going to head down to Vegas. We'll check in with Gary Lawless, see how uh, the Knights are feeling after taking two here in Winnipeg. 
um, Saturday and Monday here at Canada Life Centre. Just before we get to Gary, and don't forget Murad Atesh from Vegas a little bit later on, as well as a chat with the Moose Rookie of the Year, Dean Stewart, coming up before the Moose drop the puck at uh, on a Friday night for their playoff series. Um, big shout out to our friends at Modern Man Barber Shops, our newest sponsor here on Winnipeg Sports Talk with eight locations in Winnipeg. Visit the newest Modern Man locations on either Pemita Highway or Plessy Road or any of six other can six others conveniently located throughout the city of Winnipeg. Modern Man Barbershops guys offer a variety of grooming services, including haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. You can book your look today and make an appointment at modernmanbarber.com. And while you're at it on the gram, give them a follow at Modern Man Barbershop. So, hey, with the summer right around the corner, Aquatech wants you to make 2023 the year you take the plunge and visit aqua-tech.ca to design your own custom pool. The Aquatech team can provide on-the-spot pricing from designers as well as financing options that suit you. And while thinking about a big project for your property, the inside of your home and home renovations start with Aquatech as well. With thousands of rentals as their foundation, let Aquatech upgrade any space in your home. Aquatech's ready to make your reno dreams a reality. Learn more about design, pricing, and financing options at aqua-tech.ca. Well, we're holding on to uh, the uh, playoff hope for the Winnipeg Jets. But spring is right around the corner, and our friends at Manitoba Battery are celebrating their 10th birthday with more and more sales for everyone that's getting ready for summer fun. Right now, they're blowing out golf cart batteries. For those of you that use your cart to enjoy our beautiful Manitoba courses, or for those that use your cart to enjoy a cold one as you tour from friend to friend at your summer getaway. Six-volt golf cart batteries are now 167 and 8-volt golf cart batteries are 177 and that's just the beginning of the value. That includes free delivery anywhere within the city limits, and when you return your cores to Manitoba Battery, you'll receive another $17.50 off what's already the lowest price in Manitoba for golf cart batteries. Get them now so you can be ready for May long weekend and summer fun. Sale goes from now until May 6th. Pop by and see him at 1026 Logan Avenue or find out more information online at manitobabattery.com. Um, and just before we bring in Gary Lawless, cheers to our friends at Canadian Club, Canada's favorite Canadian whiskey, and the official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and WST. Uh, one of our favorite summer bevies is uh, back now in 473 milliliter cans. The Canadian Club and Ginger Ale, which was such a big hit at IG Field, we're counting down the days until we can enjoy a few watching the Bombers, but right now you can get it at Manitoba Liquor Marts and beer vendors throughout the city, and of course, pick up Canadian Club at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. All right, we'll have more on the Jets with Murata Tash coming out of the practice, which is going on right now, uh, but let's hit the other side of things and check in with our old pal Gary Lawless for uh, this series from the Vegas Golden Knight side of things. Oh, man, what's going on? How are you? Well, I have to say, it's disappointing to me that a gulf has, has, has appeared between you and I. I was in Winnipeg for four days, not nary a text. Hey, law man, want to have, want to go to Mitzi's for chicken fingers? <laughs> want to uh, come over to Confusion Corner for a Bud Light and a cigarette? None of the <laughs> things that um, you once invited me to share and uh, all disappeared over over a hockey series. Those aren't on so, the training um, table these days, and I know you were very busy, as we all were. Uh, you know what? Hey, jokes aside, um, yeah, this has been an incredibly tight series. But I mean, you've got a lot of background in Winnipeg. Um, what was that? What What did you make of um, games three and four? Before we get to what happened on the ice, just the atmosphere in the building around the city as uh, you and the team were downtown for um, you know the better part of four days, as you mentioned. Well, I actually have a question for you because I'm, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, but having a street party, what does that do to the atmosphere in the building? Because warm up is dead, and and it used to be, you know, a prelude of things to come. And if like for me, 
if I'm the Jets, I want the opposition to, to get a taste of, I want to start to intimidate them with the, the crowd at that point in time. And they come out and there's kind of like nothing going on. And, and for like, I, who, I'm not a psychologist, but I just kind of wonder if this softens the blow of what the whiteout is supposed to, and the, the great Winnipeg crowd is supposed to provide. Now, don't get me wrong. In game three, they were very good early. Game four, uh, that, that Monday night eight eight fifty puck drop did nobody any favors. I think that uh, there was a good portion of the crowd that was not not as energetic as they might have been in the past. And who sang the anthem for Game Four? Oh, a uh, Soul, Soul Bear. Bear. I'm a fan of Soul Bear. Yeah, Soul yeah, Bear no. did a nice did did a real nice job. He uh. He what, make, what's his background? What's his you know story? what? I'm not too sure. He's a performer and a singer. I believe yeah. a guy that's from here. I mean, I think he does a, a lot of stuff outside of the market, but he's done a few games and uh, done a great job. They've kind of mixed it up quite a bit this year amongst the different anthem singers. So uh, he came in. Listen, to your point about that, um, I yeah, don't think well, it's me. lost. I don't think it's lost on a lot of people that, you know, everything happening outside, maybe keeping people out a little bit more is maybe taken away from from, you know, the – the atmosphere for warm up, and you know that I guess is one of the price to pay. The one thing is, though, I mean, as you well know, um, there's a lot of people that want a piece of this. There's a lot of people that want to be a part of it, and uh, you know where ticket prices are and whatnot. There's a lot of people that you know aren't able to go to the game, but uh, you know I think adding that extra opportunity for people to come out and be a part of certainly makes it the event more than the uh, the event that it is. Um, and I'll yeah, say this I, to me, I would, to me, I would tweak it and, and make it for people that aren't coming to the game, you know, and, and, and that way you get, you get your crowd that's in the building and you get your crowd outside of the building. But um, Hey, I'm not in charge of the Winnipeg Jets. It's just something I noticed. Yeah. Well, I mean, and again, I mean, what's happening uh, before the game, probably a lot less important than what's happened on the ice so far. Um, this has been a really interesting series, and I'm, I'm, I want to get your perspective on how things have changed. Um, obviously, the Jets had one of their best games in a long, long time in game number one of the series. And to be honest, from where I look, we're even better in the first period of game two in Vegas. Um, what happened after that first period? And I know Bruce Cassidy's spoken to it, but maybe for our listeners – Talk about the uh, the realization that if the Vegas Golden Knights didn't step it up, they could, could be a very different situation. And credit to them for doing what they've done the last eight periods of the series. Yeah, I think they're two separate things. I think game one was, you know, Mark Stone's first game back, and he was he looked shaky at best. It was Jack Eichel's first playoff game. I think he needed to figure out, okay, how does it get played? What's the emotion level? All of those things. Um, <clears throat> and the third goal in that game, the Wheeler goal, I think Lauren, Lauren Bressois would want that goal back. And it was kind of a backbreaker. It took whatever momentum Vegas kind of had after the Carlson goal, it, it, it took it away. The first period of game two, uh, yeah, you know, I think it just took Vegas a little while to find their feet and get their game. And once they did, they took over that game. And really they've been, uh, from my perspective, uh, They've been the better team the rest of the way. They've taken away the rush from Winnipeg. Winnipeg's not getting any rush chances like they did in game one. And um, high danger chances uh, against for, for Vegas are very low. They're, they're holding Winnipeg to about six high danger, five five point three I think, high danger chances, all situations per game and around four at five on five. The Jets have five power play goals in the series. And if you take those, uh, Vegas has two. So clearly the Jets are winning that the special teams battle. But if that's a little more even, uh, uh, and I think that, you know, it's 3-1. There's not going to be, it's not going to make that much of a difference. But uh, those are the kind of the elements that I've seen. Bersois has matched Telebuck. Uh, I, I think to this point in the series, that's a storyline that no one really expected. And you talk about that save, you know, he made a big save on Shifley. He made a big save on Kyle Connor. He's had timely saves and 
allowed his team to either stay at 0-0 or when they've gotten ahead to keep them ahead. So that's kind of from from my perspective right now. I mean, you know, we can't ignore the fact that Winnipeg now is missing. The Ehlers hasn't played in the series. Morrissey is out. And, uh, um, uh, you know, when Rick Bonus said yesterday that Mark Shifley is feeling better. Uh, uh, I'd be shocked if Mark Shifley plays <clears throat> in game five, but uh, you know, maybe, maybe the, the injury that kept him out for an entire game he missed all of game four because after suffering that injury, maybe it, it was just a, a bruise and, or whatever, and uh, and he'll be fine for game five. But my experience, that's not what it looks like. Yeah, well, and I think, uh, you know, considering the way things have rolled with injuries so far, <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of people around here that are expecting him to be a player, although it sure would be nice to see uh, Nikolai Ehlers get an opportunity to play in this series. That was... Uh, you know, really unfortunate, and the fact that it came from such a blatant cheap shot from, uh, you know, Ryan Hartman, I think is. Uh, but hey, it, all you can do is play with the guys that are at. Rick Bonus is going to fill out the lineup yeah. card, and they're going to need to find a way to get this series back to Winnipeg if they don't want to be making tea times on Friday morning. Um, all that being said, Gary, and I mean, I think you, you laid it out quite well. I mean, certainly the Winnipeg Jets, special teams wise, the power play hadn't been a big strength of them going down the stretch. They've got that, but. Um, You know, if you want to win a series against a quality team like the Vegas Golden Knights, you need to be doing it at five on five. And, um, you know, even with as close as the two games were in Winnipeg, it does seem like Vegas is really um, playing to quote, I mean, use a cliche, their game when it comes to defense. Um, You know, the Winnipeg Jets have had quite a bit of offensive zone time, but I remember us talking about before this series started, Vegas is more than comfortable having you skate circles around the perimeter of their end. Um, the shot blocking, the attention to detail, and the ability to clear the front of the net and not let the Jets get there has been, um, you know, really the focus, I think, of Vegas' brand of hockey when they're playing well. And it seems like they've really got to that point in the last couple of games. Yeah, they have. Not not as long as you would like and sometimes not as early as you would like, but uh, uh, for the bulk of the games they have, that after game one, they have played their game. And the other aspect in this series is that Bruce Cassidy is, uh, you know, no one is in the double overtime game. Only two players played more than 28 minutes for Vegas. I think there were seven for Winnipeg. And and th- at the bottom of the roster, you know, there are only, you know, Vegas had no players that played under 12 minutes. And Winnipeg had, played, played, had three players, including Josh Morrissey. So, and then that whole scenario played out again in, in game four. Vegas is, you know, he's not he's not even thinking match. He's rolling his four lines and and putting his 6D out. And, uh, um, you know, and, and I think kind of, you know, putting Nick Haig and Zach Whitecloud out on the ice against, you know, uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois and Kyle Connor and Mark Scheife and – and and the Mesnikov, whoever it is, and letting them battle against Winnipeg's best players has been really good for those young players in this series. Well, and, and speaking of the depth, I mean, I think a huge story. I mean, we always talk about the Manitoba connections, and you know, we talk about Mark Stone, uh, Brett Howden is having himself a series right now, and to the point where we've seen him move up in the lineup. You know, over a guy like Barbashev, who was the big uh, the big trade deadline acquisition. I mean, he hasn't been there as long as some of these other players, but um, has he raised his game to a level that maybe we didn't see consistently through the regular season? Is this the best he's been as a Vegas Golden Knight? Uh, he finished really strong last year as well, and then he had injury issues this year that kind of, you know, he started to rise and then he got hurt and Missed missed some time. He's fast. A couple of things. He's he's been a center all his all his career. They moved him to the wing, so now he's not focused on uh, as much on uh, on the defensive side of being down low in the defensive zone. He's using his size on the wall and quite effectively when the puck comes up the wall and he needs to get it out, he gets it out. And uh, he's been really good on the forecheck. He's using his speed to open up some space for Mark Stone. He's probably the most popular guy in the dressing room. This guy is, they love him. 
He's got a big, goofy smile on his face all the time. He, uh, they got a bunch of good nicknames for him. He just had a, him and his wife just had a, a baby boy, and uh, all, his name is Charles Rhodes Howden, and uh, he's referred to as uh, Char- Charlie Rhodes Howitzer in the dressing room. So uh, uh, he just um, guys, guys like him. He's playing hard. I would say Colasar had a had a pretty good weekend in in Winnipeg too. Big time fighting a goal, uh, a couple of big hits. That hit on Lowry was was pretty massive. So and speaking of Lowry, put like, the C on him. Like come what on, a beast. This guy, this and, and he he likes Winnipeg. There's never any griping about his contract or where he wants to be. He is, uh, yeah. To me, that's an automatic culture change. Give him the C and let him lead the way. I'd take him on my team uh, any day. Yeah, Fantastic I mean, player. you know, we, we, that's it's funny you bring that up because that is a conversation we've obviously had on this program many times throughout the season. And, you know, to me, it really comes down to two obvious candidates, and that's it. It's Adam Lowry and it's Josh Morrissey. And at different times yeah. this year, each has been – you know, the leader, um, they both handle the media very well. They're both committed to the team. They're both signed long-term. I mean, Josh had an absolute breakout season and, you know, a, 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 well, who knows, maybe not a career year. Maybe this is the sign of things to come. Um, but what Lowry's done in the last month of the season, after he went through <clears throat> an incredibly long goal-scoring drought, uh, and the way that he's played in the playoffs, I think, has uh, certainly maybe changed the narrative that Morrissey was the favorite to it really being one of two. Um, I, I want to ask you about Game 3. Because over the course of seven-game playoff series, there's high, very high highs, there's really low lows. Um, Vegas was in complete control of that game after the second period. And, you know, that early goal goes in from Nito Niederreiter. Gives him a little bit of life to the crowd. And um, we all know what happened with the Jets scoring. And as you mentioned, Adam Lowry scoring that tying goal to put that one into overtime. Um, you know, it was going to probably end up on a break one way or the other. It went in the favor of the Vegas Golden Knights. And, um, you know, the Knights escaped that game with the win. What was it like around the team after that? Did they feel like they had survived blowing a lead? Or was it... I mean, this is an experienced team. You know that there's a lot of yeah. different ways to win hockey games. I mean, was it that, um, you know, they survived bottom line? In the third period, they they only didn't like one of them. You know, the Niederreiter goal, they sat back, and that resulted in that opportunity, and he scored. Uh, the power play goal, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an iffy call on Kessel, but as Bruce Cassidy said yesterday, uh, or on Sunday, he said, is it a penalty? Is it not a penalty? Doesn't matter. You have to kill it. But it's they didn't kill it, and then, you know, you, you talk about the breaks. They didn't kill it, and then, you know, you, you talk about the breaks. Stone, mm-hmm. the, the Stone had an opportunity to clear just at the end of his stick. Carlson has an opportunity to clear. They both don't, and uh, and then all of a sudden it's it's four four. But uh, they they felt pretty comfortable that they got back to their game in overtime, and uh, and and Bressois didn't face too much too much fire in overtime. And you know, from their perspective, once they got back to their game, quote unquote, it was only a matter of time before we won. So I think there was a little bit of uh, uh, Riley Smith said it was a mixture of joy and relief. Yeah, and um, you know what? You got to be confident like that. Um, you know, in yeah. uh, in a Stanley Cup playoff series, especially from your uh, from your leaders. Now they've got the opportunity to finish this one, and um, you know the last one is always the hardest one. And I think if there's one thing that we've seen from this Winnipeg Jets club is undermanned as they are with some of the injuries that they've had. Um, this is not a team that's going to go away easily no. and um, certainly is not quitting by uh, any stretch of the imagination. How would, I, I mean, when you hear Bruce Cassidy talk about upcoming game five, the opportunity to win this series at home, and maybe as importantly, if you're going to go on a long playoff run, not go through the meat grinder of an early six or seven gamer, how would you describe maybe the urgency and the focus of this team um, going in with the Jets on the ropes tomorrow night? Well, you know, I think that the one issue for the Golden Knights at times this year is they can be a little stubborn and and uh, 
just a touch arrogant, I think is probably the, the best word for it. When they play their game, five on five, they're, they're right there with Boston. They're one of the best teams in the NHL. They have depth, they have balance. From, from the Winnipeg perspective, this is how I see it. They're going to be very dangerous. Uh, with, Shif- with Shifley and Morrissey probably out of the lineup, you look at them and then you're like, they're not going to play. They're going to play real simple. They're going to pl- dump it in. They're going to play north south and they're going to be aggressive. And that to me, you know, it's probably what, the way Rick Bonus wants them to play all the time. Just it's really hard to do that with a group as highly skilled as the Jets. So, I, you know, I this could be, uh, you know, a one, one nothing, two one slobber knocker. That's kind of what I'm expecting. And, uh, and the, the, a break one way or another will determine this game. Uh, that's, uh, I, I think, for, if I'm bonus, I'm demanding a dumbed down game, a simple game. I'm rolling my lines as much as I can, and uh, and seeing it, seeing if you can, mm-hmm. seeing if you can steal one on the road and get it back to your, uh, get it back to your own building. You know, uh, the uh, the physicality in this uh, series has been noteworthy. Yeah. Um, I think both teams completely really underrated. Eh? No one, no one that isn't watching the series really closely, like Winnipeg leads the the, the playoffs in hits right now, and Vegas is fourth after uh, at, like it's. It, it, they're playing for keeps. It, it, Cassidy called it big boy hockey. Yeah, well, Sorry it really has been. And I thought, I mean, game three particularly, and obviously when you play an extra period and a half, there'll be a few more extra hits. But, I mean, the ability for both teams to be able to answer those challenges over and over again, um, it has really played a big role in this series as well. Because, you know, when we're talking about the style of game, certainly the Winnipeg Jets almost have to play right now with that level of, you know, dumping the puck in, trying to win those buck battles and the physicality. I mean, it, it, in a lot of ways, it is a um, it's a battle of who can do it longer and maintain their level of play. And yeah. I, I'm interested to see how physical this game f- um, five is because I certainly think the Jets are going to go out there with the purpose of no matter what happens, not leaving anything in the tank. Um, but at the same time, I think the Vegas Golden Knights have handled that quite well. And it doesn't seem like uh, Vegas is more than willing to play that style of hockey. Yeah, the, 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 you hear the players say it all the time. They'll we'll play any way you want to play. You want to try and uh, they're big, right? You know, I mean, you go go through their lineup. There's uh, their size uh, throughout. The, the decor is 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 huge. <clears throat> you know, you have Hag and Petrangelo and McNabb are all very very big men. So yeah, no, they'll play that style. Um, but uh, you know, it, to me they're going to have to find a way to match the urgency that Winnipeg brings and match it early. Cause uh, at some point in time, Connor Hellebuck has to, has to have one of his vintage games as well. And you wouldn't want it to be, uh, you wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to let him, give him a lead early and then let him stand on his head. So, uh, although I have to wonder, like there's gotta be a change in philosophy of Winnipeg. Why are you playing them 60 games in the regular season? Only to have them look ordinary in the first round. Like, I don't. I don't understand that. Uh, well, I'd don't take seven back, weeks uh, off in the season and force them to play thirteen games uh, in a row just to make the playoffs. That would be. Uh, <laughs> that would be a start. There you, um, go. Um, there you go. Hey, uh, I want to ask you about Cassidy quickly. You've been around this uh, organization for a while. You've seen a few <laughs> different coaches. How would you? Um, what have you seen from Cassidy in his first run in the playoffs, and how does that maybe differ from uh, previous coaches in Peter DeBoer and uh, Gerard Gallant? You know, I think he's uh, he, he's very demanding, more demanding than either of those two guys are. Uh, he's got a little Daryl Sutter in him, uh, in the sense that it's we're going to do it this way, or you're not going to play. You know, and and the guys know that, and uh, and you have to respect it, whether you like it or not. You have to respect it because he's consistent with it, and it doesn't matter who the player is. Uh, this is. This 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 is the best the the Golden Knights have ever defended uh, as a team uh, throughout uh, throughout their history. They're um, I think they're doing a real good job in that area. And there's more star power now when you have Petrangelo, Stone, and Eichel, and he has managed to find the right places for them. He, he just he's a smart coach. He, he's 
He's very active in terms of if the lines aren't going, he'll change the lines. Uh, he, you know, this, he, he finds ways to win. If, if early in a game he doesn't like something, he doesn't wait. He adjusts. Uh, and that's – he believes it's the player's job to execute. And if they're not, it's his job to move them around and put people in different places to see if he can get that out of them. And that's why they won 51 games. Only coach in NHL history to win 51 games – Back to back with different teams. Yeah, uh, not too many guys leave a team after winning fifty games, <laughs> which is interesting. But man, what a job he's done! Hey, quickly before we go, Mark Stone was a huge topic coming in. Um, you know, you kind of mentioned it was obvious that he hadn't played in a while in game number one, and then yet there he was game in game two, once again being the heart and soul of that team and leading the team back into the uh, win column. Uh, what did you think about Stone in games three and four? How is he feeling right now? Um, because it was one thing to have a great game, but man, when you've been off that long, um, you know, it is, I'm sure, a real challenge to get up on a night after night basis of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Yeah, he looks like he's getting better every game. And at, you know, at the end of game four, he makes that great play in the Jets zone to, to set up Howden. Howden misses. And then in, in the final minute, he makes. He steals the puck from Schmidt and skates it poised, and then little backhand sauce that frees frees up Howden for uh, for the insurance marker. So uh, he is getting better. He's only played five games, four games now, since back surgery in January. So he's just getting better and better from from my perspective, and that's uh, that bodes really well for the Gold Knights. He's uh, very he's their most important player in many aspects. Gary, always fun catching up. Um, we'll see what happens tomorrow night. Feel free to come and join me in the rink on Friday night for the Moose. Moose playoffs before the game on Saturday. Yeah, okay. All right. We'll, uh, I'll hopefully see off- you in Winnipeg. I have some observations that I am not going to share in the mid- of a, middle of a series. This offseason, I want to come I want to come back and talk about... Uh, some things that uh, some things that got in my shoe, a pebble in my shoe during my last visit. Well, I uh, I look forward to it, and uh, yeah, needless to say, regardless of when it starts, this is going to be quite the off season around here in Winnipeg with this hockey club. Bob, thanks for doing this, man. Take it easy. All the best, and uh, as they say, hope to see you in the peg. We'll see what happens tomorrow night. All right, see you, pal. All right, more on the Jets and Vegas Golden Knights with Murata Tesh, who's uh, finishing up at the rink right now with the Winnipeg Jets, and he'll join us in a little bit. Uh, hey, a huge thanks to our great friends over at Vita Health Fresh Market, uh, family owned and operated since 1936, with great prices on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, groceries, and Winnipeg's largest assortment of local products, too. Have you had your healthy fats today? Yes, there is such a thing. Omega-3 fatty acids are beneficial for your skin, brain, joint, and heart health. That's where Health First Omega Supreme comes in. Get your healthy fats the easy way with this one-a-day soft gel. Health First Omega Supreme is on sale all month at Vita Health Fresh Market. Vita Health, empowering people to lead healthy lives. Seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge and online at myvita.ca. Wallace and Wallace is ready for spring, folks. They are Winnipeg's fencing and overhead door specialists, serving residential and commercial customers since 1946. If your property needs the security and protection of a new fence, or if winter's done a number on your old one, give them a call. Vinyl, ornamental, welded wire, chain link, or wood, they've got the right fence for you. And if it's time to replace your garage door, Wallace and Walls has Winnipeg's largest selection of overhead garage doors as well. Give them a buzz, 452-2700. The Wallace and Walls team will arrange a time to come out and give you a free estimate. You can also visit them at wallacefences.com or pop down to their showroom on Lawson Road off of Keniston. Fellas, how's the closet looking as we get into spring and summer? If you need to up your menswear game heading into the new seasons, get on down to F Apparel. Custom suits beginning at 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories. 15% discount for wedding parties. So if you're in one this year, talk to them about getting fitted up at F Apparel. If you've got a 2023 high school grad, 
any custom suit for a high school graduate will include a free custom shirt and tie valued at about 150 bucks. Pop down and see the gang at F Apparel, 190 Smith Street, downtown. Make an appointment or find out more online at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com. And, uh, and not too nice outside right now. We're going to be getting some nicer weather coming up on the weekend, and thank God for that. It is time for a blizzard, not the Winnipeg. Well, hopefully we'll have a blizzard as far as a whiteout for Game six on Saturday. If the Jets can get the job done tomorrow, one thing I can tell you is the new summer blizzard flavors are in at your favorite local Nick and Nicky DQ location. Pop down and see them. DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, DQ St. Anne's, and the DQ in Niverville. And jump on one of those delicious stack burgers as well while you are at it. Hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba. If you want to make a uh, uh, get a custom order for a cake or ice cream cake or a blizzard cake, big thanks to Nick and Nikki for their great support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. All right, we'll get back to Vegas in a few minutes with the latest on the Jets from Murata Tesh. But let's get ready for Moose playoffs. The Moose and Milwaukee dropped the puck after a long, long wait Friday night at Canada Life Center. And the Moose Rookie of the Year and Portage La Prairie native Dean Stewart joins us now on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Dean, what's up? Welcome to WST. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. How about you guys? Uh, well, we're good. There's a lot going on right now. I mean, uh, we're in the middle of this wild series with the Jets and the Vegas Golden Knights. And, uh, Man, it seems like forever since you and your teammates have played a game. What, 13 days in between your first playoff game and the last? Uh, how have things been around Mooseville for the last little while as you guys prepare to uh, make a run at the Calder Cup? Yeah, pretty good. I think uh, obviously 13 days is uh, quite a while to to take off between the end of the regular season and playoffs. But uh, yeah, I think the coaches have done a good job, uh, you know, between – having some good pace of practice and uh and then obviously having some days off in there and so um yeah i think uh just trying to take advantage of that 13 days and obviously it's a long regular season so it's quite a few guys with uh you know bumps and bruises and stuff like that so we should be uh pretty much uh all healed up and uh, rested and ready to go let me ask you how um how did uh, Mark and the rest of the coaching staff handle the schedule? I mean, at the end of the regular season, did you guys get a few days off just to get away from the rink? Uh, were you pretty much around there? And in some ways, has it sort of been uh, almost like a training camp feel for the last little bit as you've been back on the ice getting ready for the big game one on Friday? It has actually been uh, kind of a similar schedule to a training camp. Uh, but yeah, right when uh, we got back from Chicago there, uh, we had a couple days off uh, right away and then um, I think something that uh, the coaching staff made pretty clear, and uh, I think everyone agreed with it, was, um, you know, the days that we did practice, uh, they were going to be hard practices um, with pace and things like that. So uh, I think that was a good way to approach it. And then uh, the last couple of days, we've even uh, got a couple of scrimmages in. Um, so that's been, been nice to kind of get back into uh, you know, being game ready and then uh, obviously some times for uh, special teams in there too. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, between the, some some past practices and, and battling and uh, playing in kind of game situations and, and working on those special teams, I think uh, we're about as ready as we'll ever be here. Yeah, well, I can imagine that there's a level of uh, antsiness to uh, the team right now. You can only practice uh, for so long, and especially when you're seeing what's happened in the National Hockey League, you're getting that playoff feel. It is a uh, a long, long wait, but um, I don't think there's any doubt that this team is going to be ready to go uh, come Friday night when you take on the Milwaukee Admirals. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it's a long regular season. and uh, This is, uh, you know, why you do it and so i think everyone's really excited uh obviously uh this is the team that beat us last year in playoffs uh, and there's a lot of guys uh, that are still here that uh, were here last year and so uh, i think everyone uh you know feels we kind of owe them one and uh yeah i just uh, i really think uh, we've done a good job over the last 13 days to uh you know be ready for for friday night Hey, before we get back to the series, uh, which begins on Friday, first two games here in Winnipeg, and then the next three of the best of five in Milwaukee, 
Uh, I want to talk about your season. I guess congratulations are in order right off the bat being named the Manitoba Moose Rookie of the Year. Um, tell us about the season from your perspective. I mean, you did get into 20 games last year with the Moose, but this really your first full season in the American Hockey League, 61 games played. Um, a, uh, I imagine for you, taking that next step and really establishing yourselves was a, a big step forward in your career. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, you know, for me, the first couple months anyways, that's kind of what it was about. Um, just trying to establish myself as a, as an everyday, you know, player in the league. And um, I was also really fortunate. Uh, I got to play, you know, kind of the first half of the year with Ashton Sautner, who's a, you know, really good defenseman. And then, uh, you know, the last 25 or 30 games with uh, Billy Hanola, who I'm sure you know is, uh, you know, an excellent player himself. So, uh, yeah, I was fortunate with that. And then I think uh, over time, obviously, you kind of build some, uh, trust between uh, the coaching staff and and your teammates and so I think uh, you know the second half of the year I was able to um, you know I was kind of getting a little more established as, a, as an everyday player and uh, so I think uh, kind of over the course of the year just gain confidence and and uh, you know just do do a little more each each game to, to contribute to the team winning. Uh, from, in your opinion, how big of a step is it from uh, you know playing big minutes in the East Coast League to uh, moving up to the American Hockey League, just one level away from the National Hockey League? And uh, and, and how long did it take to really get comfortable um, on a game by game basis? Uh, yeah, obviously it's an adjustment, um, and you know I think that those twenty games I played last year definitely helped in, in kind of being comfortable. Um, and then over the course of the year, this year, just gained confidence. But, um, yeah, as far as the adjustment, like, I think there definitely is an adjustment and things definitely do happen, happen quicker and you're playing against better players and things like that. But, um, you know, I think there's also, you know, part of it, it's almost a bit easier sometimes because it's, you know, I'm playing with, you know, Billy Hainola who right now, who, um, you know, it was kind of right on the cusp of, of making the NHL himself. And then um, we have a bunch of other really talented players uh, throughout our lineup. And so I think um, you're, you're playing against better players, but, you know, playing with, with the really good players too definitely uh, helps. So I think, uh, yeah, I'd say kind of over those 20 games last year's, uh, you know, was enough for me to kind of get adjusted to it. And then this year, um yeah, obviously just uh, trying to establish myself and then, uh, you know, end up building some confidence and, and playing better. Tell us about um, what it's like playing with Billy. Um, you know, we've seen him at times play with the Winnipeg Jets. He's a first-round pick, very unique, not a big player, but, I mean, a very unique skill set, very offensively talented. Um, what has it been like playing with him? How do you guys play with each other? And um, how has it helped you uh, develop as a pro? Yeah, uh, I love playing with him. Um, can't say enough good things about the guy, but uh, it's kind of it's almost eye opening sometimes. Like just seeing, you know, his confidence with the puck, you know, in certain scenarios, like whether it's you know on the offensive blue line and uh, there's a guy coming out to check him and there's nobody behind him and he's you know making plays and uh, and it works out. Um, you know, cause he's got the confidence and he has the skills. Um, and so, yeah, for me, um, you know, kind of my job is get the puck to Billy cause he's gonna, he's gonna make something happen. And so, uh, yeah, personally, I think, uh, you know, keeping it simple is, is something that the coaches have talked about for me. Um, which I think I've, I've been doing a decent job of, uh, over the course of the year. And then, uh, it's, it's nice too, like, you know, in the O zone and, and things like that, or even in the neutral zone, um, just trying to read off Philly. Like, um, I probably, well, I, I definitely haven't played with uh, anybody at that skill level. And so, um, he, he makes it easy on me too. Like he'll, he'll draw one or two guys towards him, whether that be in the four check or in the O zone and, uh, opens up space for me. And so, uh, when he gives it to me, I usually have, uh, you know, either a lane to shoot it or I'll have a forward open to, to give it to or whatever it may be. And so, 
um, yeah, I think uh, it's definitely it's definitely a treat to uh, get to play with them. You know, you always get closer maybe with uh, a defense partner than, uh, you know, just other players on the team for obvious reasons. Uh, what's he like as a teammate and uh, what is he like off the ice when uh, you guys are, uh, you know, not in game mode? Yeah. Yeah, great teammate and uh, really funny guy. Uh, he's quiet, but uh, he's definitely one of the funnier guys we have, which uh, is, yeah, it's just funny, like, uh kind of at the start of the year and last year, maybe a little quieter. Um, but, uh, you know, as you get to get to know him a little better, he opens up and, uh, you know, he's quite a character. So uh, definitely a, a fun guy to spend time with. You know, the Moose decor overall, I mean, certainly from an organizational perspective, has been, uh, you know, a spot where there's a real strength. I mean, a strength so much that, you know, unfortunately you lose a player like Johnny Kovacevic, you, you know, get picked up by the Montreal Canadiens. Um but, I mean, Billy Hainla, obviously a big part of that group. But um, Declan Chisholm, another very talented player. And, I mean, Leon Gavanka, 20-goal season from the blue line. And we can't forget players like Lundmark and Ashton Sautner, as you mentioned, uh, you know, one of your former partners. I would imagine, Dean, I mean, especially for a player like yourself that's trying to establish yourself and become a regular, um, that level of competition with the quality of defensemen on the Manitoba Moose is um, something that probably makes everybody better on an everyday basis in practice and obviously carrying it through to the games. Yeah, for sure. And I think, uh, you know, kind of more towards the start of the year, um, I think it's good. Like it, it makes everybody play better because, you know, everyone kind of knows, you know, if you're, if you're not playing well, um, there's somebody else that's, you know, more than capable, uh, ready to step in. And so I think, uh, yeah, that definitely, uh, you know, I think it's just good for the team. Um, and with that said, I mean, um, you know, you go through the league, there's not any bad decors, you know what I mean? But I think ours probably is, uh, you know, maybe a little stronger than average, uh, probably one of the better ones. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I just think uh, it, it really does end up helping helping the team. Uh, just all the all the defensemen knowing that uh, you know going to have to play well at some point here, or else uh, you know there's somebody else that's going to do it. And so, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's something we talked about. But one thing that definitely uh, kind of makes it easier about that is just uh, you know all of them are are such great guys, and so it's. You know, it's it's competition, uh, internal competition, but at the same time, uh, you know, you do anything for for any of those guys, uh, and so I think that definitely uh, helps maybe kind of take the edge off uh, of thinking. You know, it's just it's competition, uh, which it is at the end of the day, but uh, it, it's nice doing it with the uh, guys you like. Yeah, you can't be afraid of making a mistake, and you do want to have the support of your teammates, and it certainly seems that that group on the Moose Blue Line uh, provides exactly that. Dean Stewart's with us, Manitoba Moose Rookie of the Year. Game one in the Calder Cup playoff series against the Milwaukee Admirals goes on Friday night at Canada Life Centre. Tickets are available now. Um, Dean, uh, as a local product, always great to see Manitoba guys get opportunities with the Jets organization and with the Manitoba Moose. Uh, You're from Portage. An MJHL grad. I mean, for folks that might not be familiar with your past, t- uh, tell us a little bit about growing up in Portage and uh, starting your hockey career as you did. Yeah, uh, it was great. Uh, I was really lucky uh, to get to to go through the Portage minor hockey system and uh, you know play with all all my buddies growing up, and then uh, eventually getting to play for the Terriers, which uh, at the time for me was kind of like mission accomplished. Like that's really. Uh, all I ever wanted to do was, you know, growing up was play for the Terriers. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously at the end of the day, at the end of the day, every, every kid wants to play in the NHL, but, uh, you know, back then, like that's more just a dream. And so, uh, yeah, for me, it was just wanting to play for the Terriers at some point and, uh, was lucky enough to, to get to do that and, uh, win an RBC cup, uh, when I was 16 and then, uh, win the, the MJHL championship again when I was 17. So, um, yeah, and then from there to uh, University of Nebraska Omaha for for four years. Uh, which uh, what's was... that program like? That I mean, that's not an that's a newer NCAA program in the big picture of NCAA hockey. And 
Um, well, of course, Rucker McGrory, who the Jets picked in the uh, in the first round, is from there. But other than he and Jake Gensel, it's not really what people think of as a hockey hotbed. Uh, tell us about your time there with four years at the NCAA and what that was like. Yeah, that was unreal. Um, you know, I remember uh, when I was 17 and uh, getting down to having to make the decision on where I wanted to go to school. Um, I remember going to Omaha with my dad and uh, just an unreal city and uh, an unbelievable uh, rink and, and facilities and stuff. And uh, leaving there, I knew that's where I wanted to go. And um, yeah, I was so lucky. Like uh, my first year, I got to play for Dean Blaze, who was uh, kind of an accomplished uh, NCAA coach. And then having Mike Gavin out there for the next three, um, just got to learn so much from, from both of those guys. And, um, you know, a lot of things that, uh, you know, I took with me into my pro career and, um, you know, without, without those guys, I know that, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today. And, and I definitely just think, uh, you know, Gab's Gab specifically had, uh, just so many, uh, just, just kind of things to say about, uh, you know, how it's going to be when you turn pro and, um, you know, if you're not a first round pick, uh, you know, it might be a little different, uh, and, uh, you know, things might not go exactly as, as you hadn't planned out. And so, uh, I think for me, uh, getting to take a lot of the stuff that, uh, Gab's taught me, uh, just really helped me, uh, kind of excel, uh, once I got to pro and, um, you know, just super fortunate to get to, to play for him and, and play there for four years. Uh, of course, you moved on to a Wichita, and now this opportunity with the Manitoba Moose and up moving into the Calder Cup playoffs this year. Did you have um, big pro aspirations coming out of college? Or, I mean, uh, like a lot of players, I mean, you were a seventh-round pick, you know, that there is some interest, but there's a ton of players out there. How did how did the path for you go from finishing up your senior year at UNO to uh, becoming a Manitoba Moose? Yeah, well, it's actually, it was pretty interesting just because uh, my senior year was when uh, COVID was kind of shutting everything down there. And so, um, like, I remember my first year pro, uh, you know, it was getting to the end of the summer and I wasn't sure kind of what was going to happen. Um, you know, teams didn't know, like, leagues didn't know if they were going to play or not and and what was going to happen. And uh, I remember it was just before Christmas um, or, or right around Christmas that might've been, but uh, you know, still didn't even know if the American league was going to play. Um, and at the time my agent just uh, said, you know, the East coast is playing, um, you know, better to play there than to, to just not play. So maybe we go do that. Um, and now looking back, like I'm, I'm glad I did it. And obviously um coming out of school that's probably not what I had planned but um, just you know like anywhere you, you meet so many amazing guys and, and uh, you know I've got friendships that uh, you know I made in Wichita that I'll have for the rest of my life and um, you know along with that too like uh, I think there's something to be said for you know kind of getting to be the man somewhere and uh, you know being one of the top guys in Wichita and, and getting to play in the power play and, and get to play in the PK um you know, I was only 22 at the time. And so, uh, you know, still lots of time to develop, uh, you know, as a player. And so I think, uh, yeah, it, it definitely helped with, uh, you know, developing, uh, you know, skills in the power play and things like that. And so, uh, and, you know, also got to play 56 games that year, which was obviously different than college schedules. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, not necessarily what I had planned leaving college, but, uh, Looking back, I, I'm pretty fortunate to have uh, had things work out that way. Well, Dean, uh, let's focus on the present, and that, of course, is Friday night as you guys uh, finally get back on the ice after this 13-day break, and you're doing it against a very familiar opponent in the Milwaukee Admirals. These teams have a rivalry that goes back many years, and I'm sure there's no lack of familiarity between these clubs considering how much you see them in the regular season. Give us a little bit of a preview of uh what goes on between the Admirals and Moose when the puck drops on Friday night and uh, how you and your teammates are approaching this very important two games at home before the final three shift to uh, the Bradley Center? Yeah, I think, uh, well, like you said, I mean, I think, I don't know, we played them six or eight times this year. And so 
uh, and then obviously last year in the playoffs too. And so, yeah, I think uh, we know what to expect from them. And, you know, in the same breath, they probably know what to expect from us. Uh, and I think uh, it's just going to come down to executing the game plan and, and things that we've talked about all year long, um, you know, playing to our strengths and, um, you know, just simple and, and disciplined hockey. And I think, uh, you know, we know it's going to be a physical series, um, you know, watching the NHL playoffs, uh, you know, that pretty much every playoff series is going to be physical. And so, uh, you know, we're ready for that. And, um, but yeah, I think, uh, we're definitely a confident group right now. Um, you know, they've got some guys back from the NHL, uh, you know, that we, we talked about that, but, uh, you know, at the same time, I think, uh, we like our group too. I mean, we've got a handful of guys who have played in the NHL and, and even pretty consistently and, uh, you know, another handful that, uh, you know, are probably on their way to be in there. So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, like you said, obviously that 13 days off, uh, gave us a chance to, to kind of heal up and rest up and, um, we'll be uh, ready to go Friday night. Everyone's going to be fresh Friday and Sunday. Games one and two, Calder Cup playoffs. Get your tickets and get out to Canada Life Center. And uh, hopefully it'll be a very busy weekend at Canada Life Center with the game on Saturday as well. Just before we go, Dean, have you watched much of this Jets Vegas series? And uh, what have you thought? Yeah, I've been uh, I've been watching it. Uh, yeah, I think a uh, tough break, obviously. Anytime you lose a game in double overtime, that's going to sting. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm rooting for them. We had a you know handful of those guys who were with us last year, and so you're obviously you're always going to be cheering for your buddies up there. And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll see what happens, but uh, you know, I believe in them, and uh, I hope they can get it done in Vegas tomorrow night. Well, listen, we will wish you good luck and the rest of your teammates on Friday in game number one, and uh, here's to a uh, long. Calder Cup playoff run for uh, you and the Manitoba Moose Dean. It was great having you on the program and congratulations on being the rookie of the year and all the best as the uh, playoffs get going for you and the squad coming up on Friday night. Okay. Well, thanks. I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Good stuff. Thanks so much. There's Moose rookie of the year, Dean Stewart, Portage La Prairie native, former Terrier, four years at UNO and now uh, playing with Billy Hainla on the uh, Moose Blue Line as they get ready for the playoffs. And uh, I didn't ask him about the Terriers. I, I didn't want to poke the bear. Of course, Portage lost to Verdant in a heartbreaker in double overtime in Game 7. Uh, uh, but now the Verdant Oil Capitals are up against it. Game 3 goes tonight back in Verdant. The Steinbach Pistons with back-to-back -back shutouts in Games 1 and Game 2 looking to win the Manitoba Junior Hockey Championship. But the Portage Terriers aren't done because they, of course, are hosting uh, the Centennial Cup, the RBC Cup, whatever they're calling it this year. So uh, we'll have two Manitoba teams in that event, and uh, that'll be something we'll definitely pay close attention to here on Winnipeg Sports Talk coming up in the coming days. All right, uh, quick update and we'll have more on this with Marat, but uh, Rick Bonus has uh, spoken post-practice. Nikolai Ehlers on the ice in a regular jersey. Rick Bonus has said he will be a, sorry if you've heard this before, a game-time decision, um, but said that this is the best he's felt and the best he's looked. So that's optimistic. Dubois, Appleton, Stenland, all dealing with nagging things, but uh, none of them have been ruled out for Game 5. But Mark Shifley is officially out for Game 5 tomorrow night. So if you were if you were holding out hope that maybe 55 would have some heroic return, uh, it's not happening, at least for Game 5. First things first, force a Game 6, and then we'll talk about Shifley's situation as we get forward. Um, you know what? Coming up, by the way, quick curling note. Uh, shout out to Jennifer Jones and her husband, Brent Lang, representing Canada at the World Mixed Curling Championships. Took an extra end to beat the Hungarians, but they are at 7-1 and one right now, looking great out in Korea. We'll follow that. And, of course, Jennifer Jones, proud member of the Princess Auto team, who sponsor her rink on the uh, World Curling Tour. Princess Auto, proud sponsor of curling from coast to coast. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers and the place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. You can pop in store, Panit Road, Portage Avenue West. 
or shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. They will help you make it work. Um, hey, our friends at Consolidated Supply right now are ready for spring. I know Joe's going crazy, getting ready for the irrigation system to really start, the uh, irrigation time of the year to really get going. Or just about that time, if you are looking for irrigation solutions and options for your property, talk to the experts that have been working for decades with Manitoba golf courses as the leader in the industry. Um, they are the leaders in irrigation systems, artificial turf, if you're thinking on maybe that dream putting green in your backyard, and of course, golf carts, both new and used as the exclusive club car dealer in Manitoba. And when you're talking about maybe having Joe help you out with some irrigation for the lawn and grass on the property, you've got other great options for your property as well, including hot tubs and amazing outdoor kitchen options and, of course, small engine parts and repair. Pop by and see them at the showroom. They're open to the public at 1395 Niagara Road East. Or find out more online at cte.ca. Well, you all know that Royal Sports is your headquarters for the best selection of Jets merchandise, Bomber merchandise, and more. Fingers crossed we'll have another reason to put the whites on on, sa on Saturday, which will mean that the Jets win tomorrow and stay alive in their series but tomorrow night is the NFL draft. And I popped by Royal yesterday, and all of the new NFL draft hats are out right now and on the shelves. So uh, if you're all geek for the draft, for whatever NFL team you are, uh, you're a fan of, you can pop down and get the newest lid that your number one pick will be wearing tomorrow night in Kansas City where the draft is done. You can see I tweeted out a picture there. Uh, they're much better. The, some of the draft hats are sort of hit and miss. This year's are a big hit, I think, with the logo inside the lettering. Um, and as you can see, the uh, Super Bowl champion Chiefs up there on the top right. Uh, they've got a couple different versions of the Chiefs and a few of the other teams as well. Pretty much everyone accounted for. So if you want to cop those before draft day, get on down to Royal Sports today. Spring stock is well arriving daily. A tons of bikes, um, soccer boots, equipment for playing, softball, baseball, tennis equipment, and more. It's all at Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. Follow them on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina. And, uh, of course, tomorrow night, one more chance on the road at least to get together with friends at Boston Pizza and experience the whiteout for a road game. Um, great new appetizers, including the crispy dill sp uh, springs and the triple play platter featuring world famous Boston's cactus cuts, cheesy bandera bread, and the uh, Thai chicken bites. No better place to get together at it for the big game than at Boston Pizza. And chance to win a tickets to a playoff game if there is another playoff game. Get set, make your plans tomorrow to get to BP for the game. And heck, tonight, tomorrow, if you're staying in, you can always order online at bostonpizza.com. All right, let's get Remus back in here. Remus, as I mentioned, just coming out of the Dean Stewart interview, which is a lot of fun getting ready for Moose playoffs. Mark Shifley officially ruled out. Uh, we talked about it right off the bat. I wasn't holding out a lot of hope. But I don't think that should come as a surprise. Um, but I will say this. And again, take this for what it's worth, as he is still categorized as day-to-day. -day. Um, but man, with what the Jets are dealing with, with no Morrissey, with no Shifley, sure would be nice to get Nikolai Ehlers into the lineup. And it sounds like he's, I'll give him this, it sounds like he's more a possibility for Game 5 than he has been in the last week or so. Yeah, Murat tweeting out, and he's coming on uh, shortly. He said Ehlers wouldn't say either way about you know, coming in or not, I guess he learned from before yeah. the series where he said, uh, where he said he was definitely in, or I forget what the exact quote was, but he ended up not being in. He's been day-to-day -day since. Ken Weeb did say, Ehlers will be a game-time decision. This is the best he's felt and the best he's looked. Hmm, I don't know. He practiced on power play one and power play two. Um, Dubois, Appleton, Stanlin dealing with nagging things. None of them have ruled, been ruled out. And as you said, Mark Shifley has been ruled out for game five. So fingers crossed. I mean, Nikolai Ehlers would be a huge boost uh, on that second line there with uh, Niederreiter and Nemestikov. And you have Dubois there with uh, Wheeler and Connor. I mean, it would be, again, you know what he brings. And, you know, with Shifley going down, if 
just give them one less guy hurt and give a guy who can score some goals and they need to be able to score at five on five uh, against Vegas if they want to have a chance to win. Yeah, and, and I mean Ehlers has a a, a unique skill set that you know not a lot of other players in the league have. Um, he, if he's able to go tomorrow night, that will be a much needed shot of energy into the Winnipeg Jet forward group and um, another another goal scoring option that um, well the Jets desperately need right now, especially with Mark Scheifele now added to the uh, to the the uh, in infirmary, if you will. And of course, Josh Morrissey um, immediately ruled out for the series after he got hurt early in game number three. Um, looks like Marat's just about ready to come on. We'll bring him in. As I said, if you want to check out Marat's Twitter feed, there is um, a number of a, a picture of Nikolai Ehlers and a few updates on uh, everything we just told you, including Mark Shifley officially ruled out for game number five uh, i think we've got marat ready to go let's see if we can welcome him in from the rink there in vegas marat what's going on how are you hey uh just got out of rick bonus's scrum where you know he shared the news mark shifley won't play in game five uh nikolai ehlers nothing definitive there they're gonna see how he's feeling tomorrow they said he took a few more bumps in practice today they're trying to figure out how he feels physically and you know, they need that medical evaluation again tomorrow. I'm still not sure. I got to say, I think it's a great sign that he practiced on the power play. I think that it's a great sign he spoke to media too, although, of course, he wasn't giving anything definitive about tomorrow. It's all about the medical evaluation, I think. And you know what, Huss? Some of my colleagues say that, you know, he looked good out there. He looks as close to ready as he's ever been. I personally still think that his shot, he, I, I think he's limiting his range of motion. It's a bit of a muffin compared to, to usual. He can skate like the wind, but I think there's something upper body that's hampering him. We'll see. That's all I got. Yeah, and I guess I'm not surprised either way that he was less than committal. Um, you know, it was, I mean, a little bit of comedy at the beginning of the series when he declared himself ready to go and Bones pumped the brakes and we all said, oh, this is just coaches. Um, you know, blowing up smoke. And then sure enough, we haven't seen him. The one thing I think we can all agree, uh, if he is able to play even close to a rather regular Nikolai Ehlers level, this team needs him right now, Marat. I mean, it goes to say, it goes without saying that they're up against it and there's only one way to get this series back to Winnipeg and that's to win. But compounding it is the fact that two of their most important offensive players will not be in the lineup, including Mark Shifley, who Rick Bonus officially ruled out when he spoke to the media a few minutes ago. Yeah, I mean, imagine you're missing your Norris Trophy longlister, Josh Norris. Josh Norrissey, I came out of my mouth by accident. That was not deliberate. <laughs> um, Josh Morrissey uh, will get Norris Trophy votes, to be sure. Um, Mark Shifley as well out, and so there's your, your number one center, although Pierre-Luc Dubois is going to need to step up too. With Nikolai Ehlers, though, you know, it's such an interesting situation where he's such a dynamic player. He's skating like the wind, so at least the entries would conceivably be there. I go back to 2019 when he played through a partially fractured foot in that series against St. Louis. Remember, he blocked a shot at the point. I think he missed one game and came back. Remember after that series, in the media at the car wash day, the sort of end of garbage bag day, they call it, um, Nikolai Ehlers was telling us about the fracture in his foot. And I just remember there's this sense of pride he took in the fact he was able to come back and play and, you know, and, and deal with that. I think there's a real hockey culture ingrained in him. I think that if he wasn't at risk of aggravating something and making it a lot worse right now, I think that he would play. I think if you left it up to him, I think he would play. And that's why, in my opinion, we've had the Rick Bonus being the cautious one and all of this pointing to medical evaluations. So for me, if he's out tomorrow, it's not because he wants to be. Oh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I think that, I mean, these guys are, are wired. Um, they're competitors. I mean, this is their job, but also... I can't imagine how difficult it would be to be sitting in the press box watching how tight this series is, knowing the difference that he can make when he's on the ice and seeing the small margin between winning and losing that unfortunately for the Winnipeg Jets has gone the wrong way for the last three games. Yeah, it's got to be agony. Absolutely. And you, you sort of see him around the rink sometimes, you know, like, you know, at press level in the intermissions or something like that, he and the other players, you can see them. And like, you know, there's this grim 
look on his face. And it certainly it's got to be because he wants to be out there. And, you know, you, you see Cole Perfetti around the rink as well, and he's still in that non-contact jersey, so he's not going to be an, an option. I mean, that's what they do this for. In addition to the Stanley Cup dreams that all of them have, they want to be there for each other. They want to be part of it. They believe they have the power to help. And the idea that they wouldn't be able to through, you know, not their own decision, I mean, that's got to be heartbreaking. And, uh, yeah, you, you feel for them. Your heart goes out to them. And at the same time, you know, whatever your heart feels, it's still 3-1. And they still have to win. They still have the possibility that their season ends tomorrow. Well, and, uh, you know, we were talking earlier, the Islanders, uh, maybe they could take a page of the Islanders book who went in as big underdogs in Carolina last night and found a way to get that series back to home ice. And, listen, there's been absolutely no quit in this team. Um but you knew they were up against it. They were underdogs to begin with. You take out a couple really, really key players. Well, three key players, if Ehlers isn't in and hasn't been in for the last four games, uh, it makes it that much more difficult to get the job done. That being said, they're playing the game for a reason. Um, the Jets have the opportunity to get this back to the peg. You talked about it in uh, your latest at The Athletic uh, and I guess considering everything happening around this team, the injuries they're dealing with, pretty simple to start at the top of the list with Connor Hellebuck, who it's not like he hasn't played well, but he certainly hasn't, well, he hasn't stolen any games. He hasn't been able to make that one extra save. And uh, you know that he's got a lot of belief in himself, as maybe as much as any player I've ever talked to in my in my life. Um, now would be a great time for Connor Hellebuck to show what Connor Hellebuck's capable of and maybe put this team on his back tomorrow night. 100%. That is the way forward. And even heading into the series, when Winnipeg was, you know, flirting with the possibility of full strength and, you know, we thought Ehlers might be back and Shifley was healthy and Morrissey was healthy, you know, the key to Winnipeg winning and pulling off the upset from the number eight seed was Connor Hallebuck must be better than Laurent Brossois. That was the thing that everybody was banking on. Hellebuck's track record is better. His Vezina Trophy win is shinier. Um, you know, all of that. And through the first four games of this series, their numbers are almost identical. Laurent Brassois also actually has the edge and save percentage. Goal saved above expected. Neither goaltender's numbers are sterling if you look at it on the whole. And that's not good enough in terms of a result. You need Connor Hellebuck to get the result. Now, he's, you know, he spoke to the reporters at the airport yesterday on, on their way out of town, and he's talking about bounces, he's talking about all that sort of stuff. I went through all 15 goals that Vegas has scored, one of them into an empty net, so 14 goals on Connor Hellebuck, and he's got an enormous case for that. There is an enormous amount of stuff going by him that has hit a skate or a stick in positions where you wouldn't realistically give him a chance. There's a rebound or two you might not like for him. But if you're going through the process, I don't think Connor Hellebuck is playing a poor series. The problem with that, goaltending being what it is, bounces having the impact that they do, none of that matters. It's still 3-1. The hill is still that big. Connor Hellebuck has to be even better than we've seen and even better than his best has been, I think, to steal three games to get Winnipeg back in it starting tomorrow night. You know, I, I thought Pierre-Luc Dubois was an absolute force in game number one. He and Adam Lowry, from my perspective, were the top two players in that game um, and really set out the blueprint of how this team could maybe handle the Vegas Golden Knights. Hasn't been... Um, as easy, shall we say it, over the last three games. Um, what what have you thought about Dubois in the series overall through four games? And when you think about what's left of this lineup and his spot in the middle of that top line, assuming that he's good to go tomorrow, what the Winnipeg Jets need from Pierre-Luc Dubois if they're going to survive to a game six? Yeah, you know what? I wrote about this too. That's next up in the piece. And you know, Pierre-Luc Dubois has taken some days off from practice. He didn't skate today, though, you know, he'll play tomorrow. I feel fairly confident in saying that. Um, and so there's the thought that he's dealing with something a little bit nagging. At the same time, that's the time of year. I'm sure there's lots of players on Vegas that can say the same thing. So if you go through his series, well, he makes an enormous statement in game one. The way that he just flat out shrugged off Jack Eichel to set up Kyle Connor for the series opening goal, vintage Dubois, all power and vision. He saw Connor hanging out kind of towards the top of the circle, soft ice. You know, he, Connor did a great job to find space for that. And that was exactly what you want from him. Then he gets the breakaway goal, the partial breakaway to score what becomes the game winner. And you're thinking, okay, 
Pierre Luc Dubois beast mode activated. And that's some of the that's part of what Winnipeg needs, even if it's healthy, which it's not, if it's going to have a chance against Vegas. But then Jack Eichel takes over. Mark Stone takes over. William Carlson was already good. Chandler Stevenson was already good. And there are some Vegas players that are outplaying Winnipeg's remaining number one centerman. That is a problem. Winnipeg cannot get out of the series without a big game from Pierre-Luc Dubois. So I asked him about it. Like, Shifley's out. Do you look to yourself for a little bit more at this time? And, you know, his answer was, you know, I can't do that because look at how well Adam Lowry has played. Look at how well Nemesnikov played when he was a center. Look at how well Kevin Stenland has played. And I respect that because he's standing up for his teammates and he's going against the storyline that Winnipeg has only two top centers. But at the same time, Pierre-Luc Dubois is Winnipeg's top center heading into tomorrow night. There's no question about it. And he's got to play like one if Winnipeg has a chance. He has to outplay Jack Eichel or William Carlson or whoever's on the other side of the shift that he plays with. You know, fairly or unfairly, you look at the top players <clears throat> at times like this to elevate their games. Listen, I give a lot of credit to Vegas with the way that they played, especially at five on five. And I know some of the numbers would suggest that it's been pretty close. The one thing I would say at five on five is, that, I mean, the Winnipeg Jets have had a tough time getting to the middle of the ice. And we've seen a lot of perimeter play, especially with that top line. Um, we just talked about Dubois. Kyle Connor is a player that they need to be a real difference maker. And from my perspective, he's been neutralized a little bit by the Vegas Golden Knights in the way that they're defending. What have you thought about Connor's position in this series so far? And um, what what do they, you think that they need from Connor in Game 5 if this is going to come back home? Yeah, I mean, I, I spoke to Kyle Connor in advance of the series because I thought if anybody could have a really nice offensive impact for the Winnipeg Jets, it would be him. And also against a team like the Vegas Golden Knights who protects the middle of the ice as well as they do, you need speed. You need somebody who's going to make them question who they're like, they're question their zone coverage and question, do I let this guy go to the next guy? What's the communication like? And somebody who's carving across or through that offensive zone with enough threat that they have to respect him and they can't just hang out three guys or five guys packed into that ice in the in front of their goaltender. And, you know, in game one, he had success. He, he scored exactly the way he told me that Winnipeg would need to score. If you watch that goal that Dubois shrugs Zeichel off and Connor scores uh, on the ensuing pass, he's deliberately hanging out high in the zone, higher than the defensemen are ready for, because that's where the soft ice is going to be. And that's his gift. He uses his speed, but he also uses his smarts and his timing to find soft ice. And there has been none of that for him since then. And I know Rick Bonus will tell you, you know, he's getting his looks, he's getting his chances. And, you know, there's been a couple of nice dangles and deeks here, there, or the other place. But I think as the as the series has gotten tougher and, and Vegas has come to life and the middle of the ice has been tougher to get by, Connor hasn't had a lot of success fighting through the traffic to get to those areas. And the puck hasn't followed him there unless it's one or another highlight reel, you know, deke attempts. And I think he's got to be more than that. I think he's got to have more than that one angle to his game or else he's not going to be able to help uh, in, in this must win game. Well, and, and um, I, I, it was interesting and maybe you can clarify this. It did look like some of the reports on the lines today at practice, even with Nikolai Ehlers in the group that there had been a bit of a switch from Blake Wheeler and uh, Nito Niederreiter. And listen, credit where credit is due. I thought Blake Wheeler really stepped up when his team needed him in game number four and, you know, was involved throughout that game and more dangerous than we've seen him in a long time. But, I mean, with or without Ehlers, uh, and hopefully it's with, uh, how do you think that top six looks? Because I think we know that that third line is going to be playing tons as they have throughout. But the big questions now with these injuries affect both of those top two lines. Yeah, you know what? There there were enough mixes and matches, I think. You know, and a lot of the drills were run with two forwards, and, you know, some were with three today. So, I am not 100% confident in telling you what I think the lines are going to be tomorrow. Uh, the pairings, it looks like it's Dylan and Pionk and then Schmidt and DeMello. They're going to lean on their veterans as much as possible. Um, but with those forwards, you know, Pierre-Luc Dubois is going to play a role. Kyle Connor as well. Nemesnikov, Wheeler. Those are the four guys, I think, that are Nino Niederreiter as well. The five guys that you can absolutely count on there. Nikolai Ehlers, we'll see. Um, but to go back to Blake Wheeler, I think that what you saw in Game 4 was a player, you know, we can talk about his age. He's slowing down. We can talk about that. That's very real. His regular season, 
you go through all 82 games, you're not going to find 82 games where he was a, you know, a dominant dynamic player. I think that the speed is, is not there, but he is also a player with a tremendous amount of heart and he's getting as much of himself out of himself as possible right now. I thought that even heading into game four, he's been playing a very good series. The analytics bear it out. I think it's just him and Lowry, I think, are Winnipeg's game score leaders in, in this series so far. You'd have to double check on that. But he had played well. And then this was as dynamic as he's looked in ages. And I think it was pure willpower. I think it was pure. This guy has always been a gutsy player when he's on his game. And he dug somewhere deep and he found some level that he, like, was able to get to despite his 36 years of age, which isn't old, but makes him slower than he used to be, to be sure. And full credit to him for that. My big question is, I mean, what does it take out of a guy at this stage of his career to to go to that well and play a game of that level? Can he do it again in game five and in game six if there is one and in game seven if there is one? It just seems like despite the level that he's playing at, are you banking on him to be the guy that gets you all the way there? You know, I'm not sure that that's a safe bet. Well, I mean, it's all hands on deck right now, and guys are going to need to step up. I thought he was one guy that really did, but, you know, when we're talking about the top players in game score, um, however they calculate that, um, you'd like to see 80 and 81 right up there at the top of that list because that's the path for victory for the Winnipeg Jets, as well as having Connor Hellebuck being the best goalie and maybe the best player on the ice. From a defensive standpoint, everyone knew how big of a blow it was losing Josh Morrissey in game number three. Um, you mentioned about, you know, leaning on the veterans and maybe get your thoughts on uh, Neil Pionk, who I thought has really done everything and more that could have been asked of him. But one of the other sides to game four, which obviously didn't end in the Jets' favor, I thought was a great bounce back after what happened in game three from Dylan Sandberg. And I have to say, although he didn't play a ton, Logan Stanley, when he was out on the ice, certainly did not look out of place. Yeah, we're talking about minutes, like eight minutes, 12 minutes. It was a really small body of work. But, you know, it ends in a horrible bounce and Mark Shifley's injury. But the breakout pass that he made up the wall to, it goes to Nemestikov, mm-hmm. then to Wheeler, then to Shifley for the breakaway. That's Logan Stanley moving the puck quickly and assertively, using his body to protect, uh, protect it in the defensive zone and then making a smart play with it. That's Logan Stanley at his best. Everybody talks because of his size about a mean streak. I'm not sure how mean I believe he is compared to players of a different sizes than he is. But he's got puck skill when he's on his game. And when he when he's able to make those looks and, and make those exit passes, that's why he became an NHL player after an AHL career that, you know, left some folks wondering if he would. And, you know, later in the game as well, when he was part of Winnipeg's push back and third period effort, desperate trying to tie the game. Puck comes to him at the point a few times on one shift as well. And he's making fast, assertive, attacking plays, whether it's getting the puck to the net or passing off uh, and finding seams to, to other players. And if Logan Stanley can come off the bench, you know, hasn't played since game 82, hadn't played a lot before that, and play that kind of game, it gives you some faith that you can trust him on that third pair. Same with Dylan Sandberg bouncing back from the OT giveaway goal, bounces off. You know, that's a horrible bounce, and I think everybody feels for him. But the question was, you know, everybody knows it's a bounce, but what does he feel deep down in his guts, and can he come back from it? And I thought he he did really well there as well. Plus, I got to say, on Neil Pionk, I came on your show, I think, you know, it was a, a few weeks before the end of the season, and I had spoken to him kind of privately one-on-one. I'm like, Neil, um, are you playing through something right now? You know, the, the mobility, it just looks a, a little off. And he said, no, no, I, you know, I, I'm fine, 100%. And then Rick Bonus later lets out that, oh, yeah, Neil Pionk's playing through something. So I took that to, to Neil just, just now before talking to you. And I'm like, hey, man, what's going on here? You, uh, you, uh, you definitely didn't tell me what Rick Bonus told, told the world there. So what's the truth? And he said, there's a difference between being hurt and being injured. So, you know, I just uh, – I was just tied – he didn't say this. He didn't say he was hiding behind it, but that's how I interpreted it. He's like, there's just some wiggle room on the definition of your question. So, and I think that that's, it's gutsy from him. And I think that you've seen a lot of that gutsiness from him in this series where over the last two games, he's played three games worth of minutes. Yeah. And, and has been scoring. I mean, had an assist on all <laughs> three of the goals in that epic comeback, um, you know, to force overtime and, 
you know, was right there in the middle of it as well. I mean, you know, he's had a real up and down season, um, but you and a number of people have speculated that maybe there was something hampering him. And even if there is right now, um, he's doing everything he can to help this team win, uh, win games. And the bottom line is they've got to find a way to win. I'm sort of with you. That list starts with Connor Hellebuck. Um, but there's a number of players they need to get more. Just one more question about just the way these games are being played, um, you know, especially in the Vegas end. What do the Winnipeg Jets need to do, uh, in your opinion, with who's ever out there to give themselves a better chance of just making life a little bit more difficult for Lauren Brassois, who, listen, credit to him, he's made the saves where he's need them, and he's made some huge ones, as you dictated, on Mark Shifley and Kyle Connor. Um, but it he has not looked completely in control throughout the series. And you would just think that a little bit more traffic and some of the things that Rick Bonus has preached over and over again could really help the Jets maybe get that break that they're so desperately looking for. 100%. I mean, the story is that Connor Hellebuck has come down to Laurent Brassois' level, in my mind, just in terms of the results, mm-hmm. not the procedure necessarily, yeah, yeah. as opposed to Laurent Brassois has taken over the series. And... I think that you're right. Winnipeg does need to get to the middle of the ice. And, you know, I've been talking to some people and I asked Rick Bonus about that today as well. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that against a team that's going to collapse really well? Um, and so there's there's some details to it. The defensemen have to get their shot through the first layer. And, you know, to to their credit, some of Winnipeg's success has come on plays where that's happened, like Neil Pionk leading to that game-tying goal heading into overtime. You also have to get forwards who are willing to go to those areas and fight through what they what they're dealing with to get there. And so, you know, you've seen some success from Nino Niederreiter. That third line, Mason Appleton, Adam Lowry, and Morgan Barron, they're getting to those spots. And you you got to believe in in their ability. But the guys who can finish, and you know, those are your Kyle Connors of of the world right now, and um, Pierre Luc Dubois as well. When they're getting to those areas, which isn't as often as you'd like, the finish hasn't always necessarily been there, at least not since game one. And that's tough. And I think that part of that is because of how crowded it is. So Winnipeg needs to find ways to move pucks into that area and out of it. They need to find ways to draw defenders out of that tight, collapsed zone. Um, and, And I'll tell you what, I think scoring first would be an enormous deal too because when Vegas gets up and the way that they collapse, that's tough for Winnipeg to pierce through. Um... So their work is cut out for them. I tend to think that it's the fastest players who are going to be able to cause problems for that zone defense. And um, I think Kyle Connor should be able to do that. But he's got to be able to fight through some of what he's getting from those defensemen down low as well. And uh, and beyond that, I mean, they really do need some bounces and some fortune to go their way as well because they're not going to push Vegas out of the building in terms of flow of play with the roster that they have. Murata Tesh of The Athletic is with us live from Vegas post-Jets practice, getting ready for tomorrow's Game 5 Jets need to win to force a game six back here in front of the whiteout in Winnipeg. Um, folks, go to The Athletic and you can check out Marat's uh, entire piece on what needs to happen for the Winnipeg Jets to win game five, which is their only option on staying alive in these playoffs. You've also got another piece. And again, we'll spend way more time once the season is over, um, whenever that happens, talking about the off season and everything's to come. But um You know, Murat, we've talked about this, you know, in some ways a bit of a last dance feeling about the core and this, how different this team could look next season. Um, And I'm sure that was was certainly on on my mind when we saw Mark Shifley leave game four. And I imagine that was a topic in the press box as well, that, um, you know, it's hard not to look at what the Jets are dealing with, how much they're up against it, but also some of the guys they're missing and whether that might be the last time we see them as Winnipeg Jets, in particular 55. Yeah, and it's it's a shame. It is a sad thing. It is a sad story. Whether you're a Mark Shifley fan in your guts or not, you want the Winnipeg Jets to go out doing the best version of themselves, of playing you know at a, with a full roster, uh, everybody going at 100%. And obviously without Ehlers, without Morrissey, and now without Mark Shifley, that's not possible. But then you think about Shifley as, a, as an individual human being and what he's gone through, partly on his own and partly as a result of circumstances over the last few years. This injury, complete freak play. He makes the deke on Laurent Brassois. Brassois reaches out with his paddle, gets the puck to his credit, but also trips Shifley. He goes into the boards there, taking him out. And now it's possible that he'll be on the sidelines during Winnipeg's last game of the playoffs. 
We know that Winnipeg didn't make the playoffs last year, so he was on anybody there. You know, the year before that, the suspension, and that's, you know, punishment for his hit, very severe punishment, but certainly punishment for something he did. Go back, Matthew Kachuk, um, you know, the the play that he makes reaching out clumsily with his foot or dangerously with his foot to get Shifley into the boards and hurt him then too. That's a lot for a person to go through. That is a tremendous amount of frustration and struggle and pain. And Mark Shifley being a everything happens for a reason sort of person has gone to that well a whole bunch of times. I remember asking him after he was hurt by Kachuk how he reset his mentality, got positive um, coming out of a, a time that was really quite low for him. He pointed to his faith. He pointed to his parents. He pointed to the team's chaplain, Warren Coral. But now he's had to do that dance a whole bunch of times. And I'm just thinking, as a, as a man who I think has just turned 30 years old, he's gone through all of that, hasn't had playoff success here since 2018, the last time Vegas beat Winnipeg in the playoffs. If they go down now and he misses that now, one year away from free agency, isn't there just a little part of him inside that thinks, I mean, maybe my path isn't here becomes the case the extension um you know doesn't become an option then yeah it's possible he's just played his last game in winnipeg because winnipeg would need to get something back for a player in those shoes and you're right it's too soon we don't know how this is all going to play out but i think it's on all of our minds and important to to think about hey got to give a big thanks to uh, for the love of life who i think is down in vegas checking out the show appreciate the generous super chat and a big shout out to Sandy Sharp, who dropped a super chat in as well with a Go Jets Go Sandy. And for the love of life, thanks so much for the uh, for the support. Um, yeah, Mara, I mean, when we talk about Mark, listen, I'm not sure that, you know, everything that's happened over the last few years, those questions or thoughts may not have been in Mark Shifley's mind before we got to this point and another potentially very disappointing end to a season in the playoffs for Mark. But... Um, it's much more than just Mark. I mean, as we've talked about, I mean, there's major decisions to be made on the blue line. Um, we're going to see the Manitoba Moose play on the uh, on the weekend in the Calder Cup playoffs. And, you know, you're starting to have players that are in the Johnny Kovacevic situation, which are not going to be waivers exempt next year. And decisions are going to need to be made on them, as well as if they're going to move up, what spots are they taking with the veteran players that are still there right now? And, um, listen, I mean, we can talk about Mark and talk about Blake and talk about some of the defensemen um, and Pierre-Luc Dubois, of course, it all starts with Connor Hellebuck. And to me, the future of Hellebuck as the Winnipeg Jets franchise player and goaltender is probably the first thing that needs to be figured out. And um, as I say, I know he's not thinking about that right now. And uh, I'm sure Kevin Shebeldeoff will always have this in the back of their mind. But with all of that in the background, um, no better reason to uh, try and extend this ride with um, these players and their teammates and um, do it with their backs against the wall tomorrow where you are right now, and that's T-Mobile Arena. I mean, just think about ownership's perspective right now. They've just started a season ticket launch where part of the message is, hey, we're not sustainable unless you fill the building. And there is a sense that they're not necessarily interested in a rebuild. And everybody's like, why? Why wouldn't they be? And it's because of playoff revenue, in my mind. I think coming out of the pandemic, there is a sense that needs um, needs a shot in the arm in that way. And this was supposed to be a big year for them in that regard. If they don't get getting Winnipeg, I think that hurts. So if you're true north and you're not interested in a rebuild, Connor Hellebuck is your number one priority, should be based on his... Um, based on his quality of play, franchise goaltender. And Kevin Sheveldayoff must know by now what some of Connor Hellebuck's leanings are, unless Hellebuck has kept them to himself, um, and must have a plan for what happens now. Because Connor Hellebuck being a free agent in 2024 and having his pick of the world, where there's lots of teams that are better built and need goaltending desperately than Winnipeg is, I mean, if the cup is the only thing that he wants left, what's stopping him from making that exit? So if you're trying to win, you're not interested in a rebuild, I think that management has to convince Winnipeg, or sorry, convince Hellebuck that Winnipeg is a competitive team this offseason, if that's the plan. And then, you know, part of that convincing is trying to get him to sign that extension. And so what they're able to do with Shifley if they must trade him, with Dubois if they must, the pieces that come back, I mean, I think... 
that it's about keeping their franchise goaltender in town. If they're not able to do that, and you have to, you know, go out and sign somebody and, you know, try to make your playoffs somehow else without Hellebuck, the journey is much more difficult. And you can understand why some fans think they should, you know, pull it apart and start from ground zero, um, even though they're not interested in it. And even though they do have quality players and are not going to automatically be awful without them, I just think that he is the pivot point on which their future turns right now. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree on that. And I don't think it'll ever get to a, quote, ground zero just because of some of the talent that they have and the young players that, you know, will eventually be coming in. But um, let's just say that it'll be a very different team. And, and you know, when you potentially change, you know, could be your top two centers. How does that look? What does that do to the team? As well as just the ID and the personality of the team, which I think could probably use some tweaking or a change as well. Um but all of that is going to dominate our off-season conversations. Right now, there's a hockey game to play tomorrow, and that is uh, to stay alive and get this one back to Winnipeg for the Jets to play another day. Get that playoff revenue, but also give Winnipeg Jet fans a chance to throw the whites on again and uh, and hopefully see a win. Just before we go, do you have any theories on why, with such an incredible atmosphere and such amazing support from the city and fans, this team has had such a hard time winning a damn game at home in the last five years. I mean, I want to quote variants. I want to say that that's one of those shit happening sort of things. Uh, if you if you need something to hang your hat on with a guess, you might say, you know, it's gotten the Jets so amped up that they're taking bad penalties or something like that early on. I'm not sure. I just think Vegas is a good team and Winnipeg's hurting right now. So these two games, you know, I think that you can attribute to that a little bit. Um, if you go back to the last time that that they played Vegas, again, that was another tremendous team. In the middle, you're dealing with St. Louis, who went on to win the Stanley Cup. And, um, you know, I, I think it's one of those things that I could believe happened without it being the whiteout's fault, so to speak. But maybe there's some superstitious people out there who, you know, had enough and, you know, everybody's going to wear blue tomorrow. I have no idea. Well, listen, uh, we'll just take a game <laughs> six at this point. Another opportunity to test these theories uh, Saturday at, um, at Canada Life Center. But that's not happen if this team can't find a way to win. Backs against the wall. They played some of their best hockey all year when missing top players, when dealing with a lot of adversity. Let's see if they can do it again tomorrow. We'll look forward to reading all of your coverage in The Athletic from Las Vegas. Marat, thanks so much for doing this. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back in the peg, win or lose tomorrow night. Thank you very much, Huss. Thanks for having me. Good stuff. There's Murat Atesh. Uh, tons of content right now from Murat, uh, as well as focusing on Game 5. And then as we just hit at the end, the big picture of the Winnipeg Jets um, facing elimination right now in these Stanley Cup playoffs. Um, all right. I'm uh, going to give a shout-out to our friends at Little Brown Jug. Have you tried the new generic lager? Uh, man, we had a great time uh, out at the uh, Sports Trivia Night a couple weeks ago. It was my first time trying generic lager, and uh, let's just say there's been a few more since then. It is phenomenal. Light and clean to taste with a mellow flavor and a crisp finish. It's your basic lager, just better. Impressively standard in the best way. Now Manitoba can support local without having to move away from the domestic taste they've come to expect with a light beer. Available in eight packs or by the can through the tap room on William Avenue at Little Brown Jug or through vendors. Um, Mexico Open this week on the PGA Tour. John Rahm, defending champion, a massive overwhelming favorite. I can never remember a guy less than 3-1 to one to win a PGA golf tournament, but that is where we're at. We'll kind of have the bigger events resume going forward this week, and of course, some more majors coming up as well. Uh, but while we wait for golf season here in Manitoba to officially get underway, you should think about our friends over at Breezy Bend if you're thinking about a great long-term home for you and your family with the incredible 19th hole, championship course, top-notch practice facility, and great men's, ladies, and junior programs as well. Find out more at breezybend.ca or give our pal Corey Johnson a call for more information on becoming a member. And uh, it won't be too long before people are sticking lines in the water. And if you're thinking about fishing this summer, there is no better getaway 
than Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, a fly-in fishing paradise where you can be on the water in less than two hours from the city of Winnipeg. Uh, an amazing corporate uh, or, uh, customer event or very unique team building experience. And uh, I mean, about as good as it gets when it comes to friends and family trips as well. Uh, they're pro approaching 90% fully booked for the summer. So there is limited availability. Find out more right now, akinslake.com on uh, how you can make Aikens a part of your summer. And for any university students listening to this right now, if you uh, might be interested in working in paradise for a few months in summer, Pitt is looking for a couple more guides and a couple more servers. You can send a resume in to Pitt at AkinsLake.com. All right, we are going to get to the cool bet lines to finish up the program, but uh, remote good chat with uh, with Marat. We appreciate him jumping on a little later than normal in the show today because of everything happening in and around the Winnipeg Jets. And as we said, no surprise, no Mark Shifley, and you know um, maybe a little bit of Rick Bonus in Marat today saying don't put Nikolai Ehlers in pen just yet, considering what he saw from him in practice. Yeah, we'll wait and see on Ehlers. He's day-to-day. -day. We'll find out tomorrow. So it is what it's been, and um, hopefully he's in the lineup, but he wasn't saying he was in. So uh, it's unfortunate we're here this every day, and I'm sure Rick Bonus is sick of talking about it, but that's what the situation is. And, you know, you brought that up with Murad about the Jets' uh, record at home lately, and I'm just like my head is hurting here from reading the comments in the chat. So, um, you know, no one was saying that uh, the fans were a problem when they won, you know, three home games and one beat Minnesota in the first round. So um, just, yeah, so no, just any, a lot of any, silliness. Any team and any organization would kill to have the support that Winnipeg fans show up for the Winnipeg Jets in the playoffs. Yes. Uh, it's not the color of the shirts people are wearing. It's not the volume. It's not too loud. It's not too crazy. Um, at times, the team hasn't played well enough. At times, there's been a few bad breaks. I mean, there's a lot of things that's gone into it. And the other thing is you're playing really good teams at this time of year when it comes to the Stanley Cup playoffs, and nothing is given. That being said, a bounce here or there the other way, including... Saturday in double overtime could have maybe changed this narrative a bit. I just hope the Jets can earn themselves an opportunity to break that streak on uh, on Saturday. Like people saying it's a way. I'm actually like getting a headache, Hustler. Like you know, people will just wear blue and do the exact same thing. Like it doesn't matter. Like I, I, yeah. I want to wear wanna blue scream and into just be microphone. quiet. Don't cheer. Don't cheer. I'm getting very well. I'm on. getting a physical reaction reading these messages in chat. The most. You know what their record is on the road, too, during that same time frame? Not including the uh, 2020 and 2021. So what, at home, in the in front of the whiteout, not including 2020, 21, they're 5 and 11. But on the road, they're 7 and 8. So, like, they don't have a winning record no matter what. Like, come on. Well, it's tough Anyways, to roll out a winning record in playoffs. I mean, you know, considering how yeah, difficult it is. And the team hasn't had that big run since they went into 2018. There's been a lot of things that have happened. And obviously, we talked about the... Uh, the terrible luck for the organization yeah. and for Mark Shifley in particular, not having the guy that, you know, was your most important player in 2018 in that run, um, did not have a strong performance in the second half of the 2019 season or in the 2019 playoffs. But after that, the Kachuk injury, the Evans suspension, and now this, um, you know, he sort of is a walking incarnation of Murphy's law right now. when it gets to the postseason. Yeah. Anyways, uh, Brass Bonanza's right. He says, why are we talking about this? Great question. Here, I want to bring this up. Uh, I get the alerts from True North Shop on eBay, Huss, and they put some, like, memorabilia on their online store. How much would you pay for the puck that Adam Lowry scored the game-tying goal with? I know they lost the game, but that how much would you pay for that puck from game three that he tied the game? It could wow, be yours, Hustler. A, you could have it behind you. Is it an auction right now? Or? It's an on an auction. You could bid on it. Uh, a week left would be great. It would be great in the Winnipeg Sports Talk studio. Jeez, I don't know what's it going for right now. Okay, no bids. Opening bid right now. Hundred fifty dollars for the puck from the goal. I don't know, man. That would be look pretty good somewhere. You could frame it with a nice picture. I know they didn't win. But, I mean, you could say it was the puck from one of the loudest moments 
ever at Canada Life Center. I guess one of the loudest moments ever. I try not to, and again, like I've kind of said this before, and this goes back to the party dangle goal against Anaheim. I mean, there's been some incredible individual moments in Winnipeg Jet playoff history, especially at home. The party dangle was on the road, but, um, you know, that unfortunately are sort of lost to history because of the end result of the game. And, you know, there's a number of those incidents so far this series. That being said, it's not over yet, but I'll tell you what, if that was, um, well, let's just say that if they, they won the game, I'm pretty sure that that puck might not be up for auction. It might be up in some <laughs> Jets Hall of Fame or something like that. So well, take that for what it's worth. They have a bunch of other pucks from that. You want to get the Nieder right? It's They all start at 150. And I think the Nieder Rider one, I think that's kind of cool that they're available. The one that was going for more, yep. I don't know if Jack Eichel bit on it, but uh, that puck, uh, or no, the Amadio goal is 255 right now, the winner from that game. Must be some Golden Knights fans who know, but that's kind of yeah, cool. Yeah, like, I mean, listen, if you're a Golden Knights fan, like, if this was reversed and the Knights were selling uh, pucks and, like, Adam Lowry's OT and had an OT winner, would be all over that. Um, anyways, that's interesting. I did not know that that was happening, but um, yeah, anyways, yeah. if you're uh, Jack if Eichel's. you're a puck connoisseur and looking for some neat memorabilia, uh, let's hope maybe we'll be talking about some Game 6 memorabilia being available after getting the job done tomorrow. Of course, we'll be all over tomorrow's game. Ken is going to join us from Vegas to get ready for a do-or-die game five for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, speaking of do-or-die game five, the Florida Panthers have one tonight. The Islanders staved off elimination, 16 teams still alive for the Stanley Cup. Will it be 15 after tonight? Well, the odds makers say so. Looking at cool bet, the Bruins, a minus 238 favorite to take care of Paul Maurice's Florida Panthers and send them to the golf course. If you think Florida can do what the Islanders did yesterday, got a nice number, plus 200. Now, the Kraken and Avalanche are going at it tonight in Colorado. No Kale McCarr. He's suspended for his incredibly late hit on Jared McCann. Um, but, man, what a blow for the Kraken to have their leading goal scorer, 40 of them for McCann this year, out that being said, I got nothing but respect for the Kraken and what they're doing, hanging and going toe-to-toe -to -toe really right now with this defending Stanley Cup champs after Jordan Eberle's OT winner in Game 4. Uh, the Kraken, plus 148 underdogs, Avalanche, minus 175. I have to feel, though, that this is the Avalanche's game, even without Kale McCarr. The experience they have in that room, knowing how important it is to you know finish up a first-round series as soon as possible, um, the last thing they want to do is be facing elimination. I think we see the best of the Avalanche tonight, even without Kale McCarr. And I think the loss of McCann is going to be really significant on that top line for Seattle. Okay, wait. Just back. I want to re rewind back on those pucks for sale. Tristan Rivers has a great idea that Winnipeg Sports Talk should buy the Amadio puck and kill it with fire on stream. What do you think? You know what? We could probably get some donations too. And we, for that. if we Everyone melted will, it. To crowdsource, uh, crowdsource and then destroy the Amadio puck to exercise the demons yes. and any curses that might be happening with some of these breaks that are going against the Jets on home ice. The So the auction ends in six days. Christopher Metz says he would pitch in. <laughs> the auction ends in six days, so it would, it would be helping the Jets for next season. I don't think it would – well, unless they win. Sorry, they could definitely win. But um, I wouldn't, I, we wouldn't be getting the puck right away. But I'm just some good content opportunities. A ceremonial destruction of the Amadio double OT game winning puck. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. completely here for that. Tristan, <laughs> it's, an, it's an incredible, incredible idea. We could, could, we could get Dylan Sandberg to, do you think he would participate in that ceremony? Or, oh, that would be or awesome. Is that, that, is that too close to home? Oh, well, we could certainly ask him if he wants to. I mean, You'd be welcome. What's the best <laughs> way of destroying a puck, actually? Like, do we need to, like, literally melt the thing down? Does um, it need to be run over by, um, like, one of those uh, road graders? Do we stick it on a train track when a train is going over it like you used to do to flatten out pennies or change? 
what would be the best and yeah. most efficient and spectacular way of destroying that puck? I don't, I'm not sure. Um, I apologize. Give it, that's a why not question. Why not yeah. question today in the chat? Best way to destroy, to destroy a puck. <laughs> Tristan and, uh, gave. gave and Tristan, bucks. putting my money where my mouth is. Ten bucks, Tristan. You're the best. Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll. Yeah, I don't know. That is kind of funny. And uh, well, I don't know. That that would be interesting. But anyways, Kale McCarr. I didn't weigh in on that hit. What a dumb hit. The puck was nowhere near there. Took out the leading scorer. Got a game, like so lucky that he just got a game. I mean, yes. if that had happened, like honestly, if there was a, a cheap shot against you know one of the Jets' top players, like let's say Mark Scheifele was out because of something like that, um, we'd be screaming blue murder right now, and I feel for the Kraken and their fans um, because that. I mean, listen, Kale McCarr is not a guy with a long rap sheet. But it doesn't change the fact that, I mean, he just went and targeted way after the play the number one goal scorer on the Seattle Kraken, and now McCann can't play tonight. And if he's out for game six and McCarr's coming back in, I think that is a uh, that is a tough look. And I realize they can't just indefinitely suspend a guy to see when a player comes back, um, but it really doesn't seem even. And again, I'm just going to start getting triggered more about Ryan Hartman scoring the double OT winner in game one for the Wild when Nikolai Ehlers is still dealing with the aftermath of that cheap shot in game 81 of the regular season, which all it did was cost Hartman one regular season game, and he was right back there with his teammates when it really counted and Ehlers couldn't play. Yeah, so I, I'll be honest. Like if, you never know what they're going to do with these suspensions. It's you know We're going to get to this Toronto game. Michael Bunting's you know back from his suspension. He, he's not even in the lineup, but as far as this Colorado series, I've been picking Colorado every time. Uh, their players on DraftKings, I just think over seven games they got, they're going to take it. But McCarr is definitely a big loss. But Seattle, they keep proving everyone wrong. I mean, they have more playoff home playoff wins than the Jets in the last five years. Right, Huss? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, in front of, in front of fans uh, because he, those he, games against the Oilers. Like you were telling me off air. You know, it's well, funny. Like they played at home against the Oilers, but it's almost like it didn't happen because nobody was there to witness it. Well, and, 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 you know, we've been talking a lot about this run of, you know, losses at home. Um, you know, the, and listen, I'll always remember that series fondly. I mean, it was so much fun beating Edmonton. And that was, of course, was during a COVID time where no one could do anything. They're, all eyes were on it. But being in the building at these games on the weekend and just thinking about what could have been. I mean, if you were there for that OT winner, there for the 4-1 comeback, I mean, all those things that we remember from watching on TV, I mean, it's just nothing like being in the building. And um, yeah, in some ways, it's just thought of differently. It's thought of as a different count. And listen, I'm sure the Lightning um, don't apologize to anyone when they get their Stanley Cup rings and, you know, Rick Bonus and the Dallas Stars with that incredible run. Uh, it's just different, though. and We felt the energy at the rink. We've seen it around the league right now. And um, as they say, the uh, I'm sure they'll have a lot of it tomorrow in Vegas for game number five uh, as the Jets need to step up and find a way to uh, get through everything being thrown at them and get this series back to Winnipeg. Um, by the way, if you're at the Cool Bet lines, and if you like, if you've got some faith that the Jets are going to pull it off, and maybe do what has been done to Winnipeg at times before in NHL history, uh, plus 900 on the Jets to uh, win game five, win game six, and win game seven and advance. So at nine to one underdogs right now. Other series prices all up right now. NFL draft odds as well for Thursday night. Um, and a big night in the NBA playoffs tonight. I'm actually quite looking forward to this Warriors-Kings game. Back in Sacramento, we'll see whether the Kings can light the beam and put the defending champs within one game of being eliminated. Um, great show today. Thanks to Dean Smith, uh, Dean Stewart, excuse me, for coming on and um, looking forward to the moose. We'll have uh, some moose tickets to give away um, tomorrow or Friday, so stay tuned for that. Um, of course, Gary Lawless, always fun catching up with Gary, even though... I was somewhat dreading our conversation, knowing that the Knights were up on the Jets 3-1. to one. He didn't come at us too hard. And, um, I mean, hey, as I said, it's a long series. It's not over yet. Hopefully it will be a long series. It could be 
done in about 36 hours. But we'll worry about that tomorrow. We'll bring the positive vibes for Thursday's game day episode of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Ken Wee will join us from Vegas. We'll set it all up. We'll hear from Rick Bonus. We'll hear from some of the members of the Winnipeg Jets. And if it's the Jets' last stand, we'll be here with you before it and, of course, on Friday after it. But uh, I think we're all kind of pulling in the same direction. That uh, Get down there. Win a game. You did it in game one already, albeit you've had a couple important players knocked out. Get this series back to Winnipeg in front of game six and see what can happen on home ice. Uh, huge thanks to the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Couldn't do it without you. And of course, everyone with us in the live YouTube chat. If you haven't already, hit that thumbs up and make sure you hit that red subscribe button and uh, tell a friend about Winnipeg Sports Talk too. No better way to spread the word than uh, those of you that make us a part of your day each and every day. Um, great stuff for Michael Remus. I'm Andrew Patterson. We got to get the pods up. We will see you tomorrow for potentially, hopefully not, the final playoff game of this series. Jets last stand. We'll find out tomorrow. We'll break it all down at 1 o'clock. We'll see you then on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.